if you don't know exactly what your plan is going into that race and you've done it before, then it's a different ball game. And this is what this was what the Olympic final was like in London in 2012. It's like, you know, it's a big difference sitting there the night before the final going, we're going to do something we've never done before. Right. We've never done this. We are going to lead the German. We're going to go as hard as we can until we're in the lead. And we're going to keep going until that point. And that means that we could blow our doors off. Hey, what is up? Welcome to Last Show Counts. We've got a fantastic episode planned out today. We have a panel consisting of Alex Partridge, Alistair Hefko, and Ben Lewis, uh, which all of them are Brooks and British rowing legends. So it's with great pleasure that we can welcome you all to the podcast. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks, for, thanks for coming, guys. Obviously, big thanks for, for Alex for helping us um, set this up. Um, uh, a whole bunch of things we'll, we'll get into, which I think will be really fun. But uh, just even before we start filming, you guys all sort of, sort of arguing about all sorts. So I'm sure we'll, I'm sure we'll have fun with all that. Um, obviously, we've had Alex and Ben uh, on the podcast before. I won't, I won't make you introduce yourself. I want to get Alex to introduce Al just for some of your uh, um, highlights. <laughs> me me introduce yeah. that. Uh, well, on. so uh, yeah, on my well, it's a great privilege to be next to uh, Mr. Alistair Hethcott. Uh, I think the last time we did a uh, yes. an interview together was in Beijing, where um, he was uh, preparing <laughs> to be uh, a, a an oil fish, boy. Yeah, oil boy. Oil boy. The, you can cut that. That would be very genius <laughs> <interview>. Okay. <laughs> uh, it could still be found, by the way. Uh, uh, no, uh, yeah, uh, applying for positions in uh, the Swedish uh, volleyball team. Um, but um, uh, yeah, so Al, you know, Al was uh, one of um, one of the guys. Al, both Al and Ben were one of the guys I looked up to when I was at school uh, in rowing. Um, what I looked, looked looked at them going past at a rapid speed, or never saw at all. Uh, but yeah, Al, uh, Al was at Eton and, uh, and Newcastle, and then we had the, the you know the privilege to had the privilege to kind of row with him at Brooks, um, and then uh, and then many years later. Um, in the British, uh, in the British team, uh, and the same eight um, in uh, in Beijing, um, we we briefly tried a stir and pair combination that didn't work very well at all uh, with me behind him, um, and uh, and we were awful. Yeah, it was very bad. Um, and then uh, and then we you know went on to uh, to get a silver medal. Um, you know what you know what could have been you know, better uh, in Beijing, uh, which was pretty awesome and one of the best you know best. Best boats and funnest times I ever had in my rowing career. Awesome. And we again just discussed just before we got on air that um, like any good rower, you've managed to retire a few times and then come back to I've, the sport. I've retired more times than, uh, I mean... Are you going to try and take I think, the... I think in my... <laughs> I think in the period when I was trying to get in the British team, and this is no joke, this is not an exaggeration, I, I counted once I retired 25 times. <laughs> in under a year it's like someone trying to quit, quit smoking uh, isn't it <laughs> I don't know what it is but that, that, let's just hope I don't get into anything else because uh, that has any addictive kind of function to it because it's never going to stop but I did eventually retire finally because um, I think the last time I actually I think I wrote you know, I, I put down my oar off to the Olympic final and in my head, that was going to be it. That, was, that is it. I'm not, this is going to be one of those stories I tell, like, I'm, I will never pick this and a lot ever again. And then I think I wrote it in the head of the river from Wolsey or something. No, yes, you did. I could yeah. tune to Rome. For like, and, and you were like, you come on, just do it. And I, I, I was like, there's not a chance in hell I will ever do this. You're never going to make me do it. Just come down for one row, one pre, pre head of the river. I said, I've just been drinking and smoking for the last eight months. How could I possibly get get through the game 10. Uh, Heather River course the game 10, game 10. But, but, but that was pretty I mean I was good for about I think it's good till about the bandstand game 10 and then to was, the bandstand I say there's and nothing then, and then the, you can hear the click click of the suitcase open <laughs> I get my deck chair out there's nothing <laughs> that make you regret your your decision to come back to anyway, that's, like, yeah, the time that's like um, when, when, or, when I did a comeback in 2016 um, and uh, and it was uh, me a guy called Dave Gillard and uh, Rick Eggington yeah. actually came back and Lucas Spick, you know, he's like four time, maybe five time Olympic medalist. 
and uh, we we were preparing for the head of the river, and uh, we did the Reading head, and uh, and we were in the you know the eight together, um, and and the Brooks had all the telemetry and all the measurement of all the watts, and <laughs> Richard was like uh, Richard and Henry like took myself and Luca to the side, and and, um, and they were like, right, you guys, you know, it's absolutely brilliant. They were like, um, you know, Alex, you know, you were like four hundred and fifty watts for seven minutes and they were like luca you know absolutely phenomenal peak power you were like 600 watts but for three minutes of the 17 minute race <laughs> they're like all we want you to do is we want you to spread that out <laughs> because you were 600 and then you were 150. <laughs> luca didn't take you very well did he i don't no 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 so he pulled even harder the second hmm. second second race is reading head reading <laughs> head i mean <laughs> yeah so he pulled even harder. Uh, but uh, but he was an awesome guy to, to row with it was pretty cool yeah cool um so then I guess a, a bit of the, the sort of coming in and out of rowing was also with you being in the army. Was that kind of stumbling um, and starting in? Or? I mean, what? so Alex was mentioning this before we, we started this. Um, I finished Brooks and then Spratly said um, that they need a spare pair up in uh, Silveretta for the, for, the, for the altitude camp. And um and he said I I, I remember this like I wish I you know had recorded it because there was proof there that there was something there was a light at the end of the tunnel for this because he kind of semi promised that if we did well up there we we'd get potentially to be looked at for the world championships I mean probably the like Cox Four or something but whatever and I thought okay well I'll go up for that because that's you know I might be able to get anyway we went up there and um and it was me and Jay on <clears throat> sorry. And um, and we just got stuck into it, and it was, I mean, it was pretty bad, but um, uh, 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 Jürgen had said, we need a straight sider, we need a bow sider. Um, and I, I was doing two straight sider. Was on a straight sider? <laughs> no, and I can't you rode both anyway. I can't remember which side I was on. Anyway, I was on one side, which, and I hadn't rowed on the other side. I think ever, probably. Side, yeah. yeah, that's right. I never rowed on bow side. And, um, and I said to... on bow side? Well, <laughs> no, 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 hold on. I was on, no, no, no. Oh, well, anyway, whatever. But I hadn't rowed on the side for a long time. And then, um, and I said to Spratly, look, is it okay? You know, is he, does he understand that I'm not, I don't actually roll on that side? And he's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. He's, he doesn't matter. He doesn't matter. And so I started around and I thought, I can't show anyone my hands because they are so, uh, so, uh, uh you can swear. That's fine. Uh, fucked. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, and then one day I was at breakfast and, and you know, goes, what's, Alistair, what's, why are you showing your hands on the table? Turn them over, and I turned them over, and they were, there was just no skin on any of it. And he goes, "You need to go to the hospital down the mountain." And I said, "Okay, fine. Um, he's going to take me." No, no one takes you. You go on my bike. <laughs> where's the, where's the, where is the hospital? He's like, "Oh, he's twenty-five miles down the mountain, whatever it was, probably all that far." Anyway, so I had to cycle down and cycle up. And then he said, oh, "And uh, when you come up, you tell me, and my son, you will race my son from the bottom of the mountain to the top of the mountain." I'm not going to do the accent anymore. <laughs> and, and um and I said okay uh, so he's your son oh here he is he's coming now he's like a four foot eight uh, four foot eight cyclist you know basically a proper cyclist and he goes you'll race him and you'll beat him and I was like oh I don't really ride bikes and what bike am I going to use oh you use my bike I was like where's your bike <laughs> so there and had a basket on the front <laughs> fell three gears a proper coach and I, I mean I, d I obviously lost to him but not by that much and bloody and that was the most painful thing I ever did up there was that where I was getting this I think it was rambling but um, no but, but you had uh, hope of going yeah to yeah and then I got to the end and I think we got to about three quarters of the way three and I said yeah you can have a quiet word because um, I said Richard Scrantley said um, you know we might get a chance to wear the world chance and he goes no why would you do why would we do that <laughs> and I was like I wouldn't be being poor no that was never the plan and I was like oh right okay and from that moment, I just checked out. <laughs> and he said, oh, can you do an ergo? And I just used to get in the ergo in the, in the shed, whatever, and then just go up to the bar and have a coffee and watch that weird day everyone rowing. <laughs> I did about 400 metres of the 16K ergo. And by the end of the camera, I was so unfit. So I done anything. <laughs> anyway, there you go. So what year was that? 2001? 2004. No, 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 it wasn't. Cause, no, it, yeah, was, no, 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 it wasn't. Yes, it was. Cause Cause I he was in Basra in 2004. Uh, 2001. I, hadn't, I joined the Army. I joined the Army in 2001. So it must have been before that. It was one. It was after Henley in 01. Um, it was, yeah, because 
Yeah, it was A1, definitely. Oh, right, okay, yeah. yeah, we were, yeah, yeah. So then, so that's when you sort of finished rowing and went into the army? Uh, yeah. yeah, and then after that, I thought, you know, well, well this is kind of, what's the point? Um, and also, I, I wasn't that into rowing anyway, um, really, ever. Not really, no. You can say that. I remember we had Stormy Rouse in the corner of Wimbledon. You hate it. I hate this fucking sport. I, 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 I never like that. You have to go off and have a tennis. It's an awful sport. I think you were tired several times in one out. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it, is it is not a fun sport. I don't know why anyone does it. Well, um, wait, wait. Anyway, I'm, I'm glad everyone's into it. He's listening to this, but I'm, I'm certainly not. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, be fair, yeah. you're pretty consistent over 20 odd years. Yeah, old, you? yeah. <laughs> I'm just very good at complaining about stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you are actually in one of the best. But the, the no, yeah. So I think I, I went. That's right. I mean, I, I just thought this is great because I can go and do something else, and I didn't have to worry about rowing anymore. And then yeah, and join the army straight after that, really. And then I when the wife was in for the army. Yeah, but that's because someone wanted me to again. <laughs> yeah. And then retired again. Retired again. Retired again. Yeah, but it wasn't. It wasn't really. It wasn't proper serious rowing. That that was just. I was like rowing in the army. The four sods that you'd be in the handy final, that. Well, they off. Yeah, they beat Thames. <laughs> and then Al ended up pledging attempts. Yeah, it didn't. Four missed attempts. Yeah. So how do you end up rowing going that much? He's retired three times from when, when Henley retired. He <laughs> retired from. Bro- well, when, bro- when it's the only thing you know, when it's the only thing you know, and you're desperate, yeah, you just think, what yeah. else am I going to do with my life? What was the draw then? <laughs> it was just to, just to push yourself, push the limits? It was, sorry. The... Like to keep rowing, to go back oh, to uh, No, it was just, I, I don't know, I don't know about anyone else, but I just, I find like, I just, if there are good friends who are doing it, and it's fun, well, it's not fun, but the, the friends are fun, uh, then you end up doing whatever, you know, that's probably why I joined the army. I mean, it's not like I want to crawl around in the mud and, you know, get shot. The but, um, the but, but it's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that's probably why a lot of people do a lot of these yeah. things because it's not about necessarily all about doing the thing itself. But, you know, and there's a group of people that, oh, do you want to do the try and win the Y Folds? And if there's a chance of winning something at Henley, and, you know, it's a good chance of doing it and it's not going to be that onerous. So, like, you know, spend four years doing the training or something, just dip it and out <clears throat> like the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, then, uh, then it might be worth doing. So, so yeah, we just I think that's coming. We do you know we are I think before the Roy Falls we I, we only did, I think we did less than ten outings, because we had to do or because no one can train together because everyone's all over the country or abroad or whatever. So um, we did our own program, um, you know, and we just had to do ergos and things. I mean, it's not like we didn't need training. We did lots of training, but all on your own time, um, like ergos and things. And then and then we yeah I think we had like eight outings, yeah. before the regatta. Yeah. And then and that's when, camp, when we actually got here to do right, and then we did more outings on the road, on the course just before the gather than we did <laughs> the, the entire year. Let's go. The good, good, good thing about the club events, that five day event, like you have a chance to come, so, yeah, get them together because then yeah. finally you're like, you know, yeah, because yeah, well, there's a lot of intensity about it. There's an intensity. I mean, that is, I mean, I did notice that actually. I would say, not 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 from you know my personal perspective, but having coached the Thames, but it is for me the more, more most impressive type of a rower is a club rower because of all the other like requirements they have in their life like some are married they've got kids they've got a job i mean it is the easiest thing the laziest and easiest thing in the world to row as a student you you are a lazy person the most of them are just lazy people I didn't even who have one that. thing and that is rowing I and they do that student. and they use all their energy to do rowing yeah but nothing else because yeah. I, I did it myself i just rowed and didn't do any academic work it's physically but, um, hard. The but... cabras. I mean, I just it just boggles my mind. Like it is, yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, well, but also, yeah. but like, I, th- I found when I was working when I in 2016, you know, like when I was working and rowing, it was such a good uh, release. You know, I had kids. I was driving all the country. I threw the ergo in the back of the car. I was doing ergos on Dartmoor and all of that kind of stuff. But it's like it was like the one thing in your day that you were looking forward to. They could just separate you from the rest of the world. Do you, do you know what I mean? It was, you know, yeah. I found it the most rewarding. I didn't. And I, but it yeah. separated you from everyone else you were working with, right? Because you, everyone else is just doing the same mundane thing that you do day in day out, and you were you were actually doing something that had a purpose and had a goal. Yeah, you know, rather. I made you so important, kind of. I think I was part about Club Ray actually, because he obviously did the, he did coach Thames. Um, he probably isn't recognised enough. He's what I put those guys to at the 10 years ago to turn them around. It was brutal. I, I won my red box 
here with a full-time job and it was the most tired I've ever been and I've got three kids and it nearly completely broke me doing all the training 15 hours a job and that guy point those guys in the city James Padmore type guys that I've I mean, Al of Chicago in 2016, it is absolutely brutal. Yeah, I mean, I can't, someone else we were talking to, the other thing you don't realise is that if you row as a club rower with a full-time job, every single day of your leave will go on trading your camps. trading camp and your Henley week. Again, and, and, yeah, again. Yeah, get All your spare cash. There's no other holiday. Yeah. yeah. That's your holiday is, is training camp. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can't do it for many. Oh, some people... <clears throat> Excuse me, some people did it for many years, but I mean, how they did that, I don't know. Five hours around Leicester. You, they, yeah, they, they, but it, most people, everyone. like, you, you know, I think there are a lot of people who, like, were good at, you know, they, good, they, they, quite good at school or whatever, and then they were, like, never quite won a medal and they want to do it. And then I, my only chance to do this is to do it whilst I work at the same time and I've got to join a club. And they do it for a year, maybe two years max, to do it. And if it doesn't, fa- it doesn't work, I mean, that is... That's quite a lot of effort yeah. to put in to not get, you know, to not achieve your goals. So, yeah, a lot of the stuff for like James Lindsay Fit, you know, making the Olympic team when he's pretty much yeah, job running, yeah, very full time. Uh, sorry, work. Well, that's how it all was back in the day. You know, the the Shell brothers were training around jobs and how mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. the hell they did that interval training in the morning and weights in the evening and you yeah, know, trying to go to the Olympics. It's, yeah, that was basically it was club rowing just with. Bigger bloke. Didn't but, Tim but, Foster but, say that he was working yeah. at a fishmonger? Yeah, and then commuting like from Bedford all the way to London and then back all in the same day. Like, but like, I think you know, I think I, well, let's not. I think <clears throat> the diff, you know, the difference. I think in the international level versus the club level in those days was was not such a big gap. Yeah. Um, I think I think the club level has definitely moved on, but not hugely, uh, and it's not distributed equally across. I think certainly in the UK, um, but the international level is another level again. Now you know the, there's just not possible. Well, you pay to train rest. Yeah, whereas exactly. club rowing, they're still fitting around so The training's got smarter, the boats have got better, but your right hasn't fundamentally changed that much. Yeah. From when I was rowing the Thames Cup when I was 19, yeah, but it can't change much. No, it can't change. Really You're can't. restrained by all the time and everything. Yeah. Well, internationals now, is, you know, how much more training? Can they, then you know, like people who do Ironman, you know, Ironmans and triathletes and stuff like that, on their spare time, and they work and they pump all their money into like a nice bike and all that sort of stuff. They get up at four a.m. and like do a four-hour cycle before work. Yeah. I mean, it happens. Did you do that for your Ironman? Man, I've seen that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do any of that. So. You did an Ironman? No, no the fir- I did an Ironman, but the, the furthest I'd ever cycled was sixty miles in my entire life, and I did that once. But I, and, and, and yeah, I, th- I think I think when you're when you're training like that, when you would be whether it's an Ironman or and you're working, like getting up at four in the morning, there's a there's a sort of I mean this is there's a a purpose in life outside of just life. You know, there's a real reason. And also, you, know, you talked about why do you do it? You do it because you're doing it. Well, not Ironman, but for, for certainly the brain. I was doing it because I did not want to let down my mates. Do you know what I mean? So like, well, I woke up and I did the training. When you were training for the Wide Falls in the army, you were in different places. And that's the same with me when I was back at Brooks in 2016. I I wanted to do the training because I didn't want to let my mates down. Yeah. And I wanted to get, you know, good scores because I wanted to, 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 to show them and push them on. But it gives you a, you know, much bigger purpose than just everyday, you know, normal grind, you know, and, and you know, it's only finite as well. You know, it's going to finish, you know, first weekend in July. Mm. Um, and then it's up. As Imogen Grant said that, I thought her podcast was brilliant. She said, if you want to do it, you'll find a way. Yeah. You yeah. Know, that is the end of the day. Is what is your, if your burning desire is enough, now obviously Al, Al will do a year on, a year off. And that's fine, you know, catch him going. Yeah. And he's obviously talented enough for it to work. But um, Imogen's point, yeah. spot on. If you want to do it, if I was getting up at five in the morning, we'll do it. Yeah. And just, just to add to that purpose, like when you're an athlete and you're training, especially towards something like the Olympics, you carry yourself differently every day. You wake up. Okay. I'm doing something important. I'm, you know, you have to like really look after yourself. And like that attitude, like carries into all the other aspects of your life as well. Cause then you, you're not just a regular person. You, you're actually, you know, out here conquering the world almost. It's, yeah. I get that sense of it. You're probably, you're on the one hand, you're not, you're just kind of rowing backwards. 
uh, and like on some random 2k court like it doesn't mean that the back was down a river yeah, yeah. But, but at the same time it does yeah and it makes you feel like you know you're getting the most out of yourself like actually yeah i i, I really struggled with that i really struggled with that when i was rowing you know i didn't understand why it was important and it's not really important to anybody else in the world but i i, I was like you know i'm getting money to do this full time and i was like you know what does this mean for anybody else in the world? It doesn't really mean anything. You know what I mean? It's not like I'm saving people's lives or, do you know what I mean? And I used to really, really struggle. So when you say, you know, you carry yourself different, I actually used to live in this kind of really confused uh, place where, you know, I was doing something I absolutely loved. I was living in a sort of state of paranoia about if I don't do well today, I'm going to lose my place, you know? And then I was also struggling, you know, and I re- this is something that I aspired to my whole life but why is that important, you know? Um, and actually, what does it matter? It doesn't matter. And um, and 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 I think you know, I really, really struggled with that the whole time. So when you say you walk around this, per, per, you know, this sense of dif- difference, for me, you know, I walk around with this kind of sense of confusion of like, you know, really, should I be doing this? It's a bit fair. Pay to do your hobby. Yeah, is this fair on everyone else? Yeah, you know, uh, what 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 benefit does this give society? Oh. And then I look at, but then I finished rowing, and I realized actually. Yeah, what benefit does a lot of what anybody does benefit society? And actually, what I was doing is I was doing something really to the best of my ability, yeah. to the absolute best of my ability, yeah. um, that you get rarely get the chance to do. And then that's showing other people that they can do other things to their best of their ability. I mean, so for example, my son, you know, now he he loves rugby, and he's like his goal is not you know I want to play well for any Orcs. He's like I want to play for England. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think his mind, and so suddenly he's switched. You know, he's ten years old. He's training three times a week. He's doing all the extra stuff. I mean, he's doing bench press in the garage. My son, <laughs> my son said the same <laughs> thing. So we'll see where they are in about ten years. Yeah, yeah. he's broken probably. I but... asked my, I asked my daughter you want to run. She's like, that looks like the worst thing in the world. <laughs> yeah, never. Yeah, but <laughs> and I was like, well, you're definitely my daughter. <laughs> a bit of a bit of worry at one point whether she was, but now I'm absolutely convinced. Yeah, yeah, but my so none of my kids, you know, have a desire, and I don't want it. You know, yeah, to write. I think uh, you hit the nail on the head. Yeah, it's it's like pursuit of excellence, like being as good as you can be in whatever you do. And like you said, even though it doesn't, whether someone has an interest in rowing or not, and showing people that you can. I think with it. that, though, it comes if you were doing it at that level. I mean, certainly I find it, and no one's going to disagree with me on this because um, it's just a fact. But it's not you lose the you lose the uh, when you get into the international system of doing things, you give up the enjoyment or, or the, the benefit of the kind of team camaraderie type thing in, to some extent because of this consistent testing, mm. consistent yeah. like worry that you're going to get it wrong. You know, every single time, every single day. So you never actually get, you never really, you never really feel like you're in a team like you do if you're a, I mean, I spoke, speak to like Osbridge people and that is like the pinnacle of like team camaraderie I've ever heard or seen in my entire life. Like they're all still mates and they'll, They'll have a reunion every year till the day they die. Whereas, like, when have we ever got together? Yeah, we've been crewed. To literally never. I mean, <laughs> never. No. We've never all got together. Never, ever, ever. No. And uh, yeah. we're, we'll be coming up to 20, nearly 20 years. I mean, you know, it's it's weird, though, because it's just such a... You think, well, it's I think in other people's 24 have... years, <clears throat> in other people's heads, they think, oh, well, you know, like an Olympic team, they're gonna be, you know, they're just, they bonded and all this. And you're like, it's not the same thing. It is like... A consistent you only get in a team and even then you're thinking am i get you know if i do something wrong i'm gonna get dropped even almost up to the last minute you're like and then finally get on the 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 look the start line of the final of the olympics you think shit i'm, I'm in the crew now yeah, or or like if you're in the crew if you do do something it's like oh is it, well, maybe so and so is going to tell on me do you know what i mean like if I, if I do the wrong thing they're going to like you know when i you know it's like i'm I, you know i missed a a, a tour of um Tiananmen Square when we did a, a tour out in Beijing because a group of us gone out blowing our eardrums out at a nightclub. <laughs> How was that? Uh, you didn't go. Um, it was... But no, but see, <laughs> me included. No, no, no. <laughs> Beijing, we went out to Beijing in 2007. Yes, yeah, so he wouldn't... Oh, uh, yeah, you, you, team, you didn't point. go. When, hey, well, you would have been there with me. Yeah, no, that's the one thing I would have enjoyed. And then we all go out. That's and then, the one and then, better and then, the whole thing that someone, do. someone on bow side in the boat that I was in in 2007 goes, Oh, where's Alex Partridge? And it's like, you know, where's a Brooks or, you know, you would have covered everyone's backs. You, would have, you know, Alex who? He's here. Oh, he's at the back, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's good. 
and uh, <laughs> because because it was all one upmanship, and you know, but not so. I can't, you know, like so. For example, I was in the team with Langers and Rick, pretty much like all the way through my career. You know, and I'm really, you know, I would consider them like you know brothers when I was you know in the team. Um, uh, but how, do we see each other? You know, very often now. Like it's hard. Well, I left I because of my back. I left a bit earlier than the guys I went in the team with. And then like so, if they're still in the system, you know, not it's impossible because they're still like 100 percent focused on that. And then you've got to go and like do a job and make some money and do things like that. Um, but I think that's a good point. Like we spoke. There's quite a few people really have kind of mentioned that. Um, it seemed probably more of an old-fashioned way of doing things, but there are a lot of coaches that still like the stick and they're still trying to pit you against each other every day because they think that will progress. It's but, interesting listening to Matt Aldridge's yesterday and then listening to these two. You think they're you're talking almost two different yeah. coaches. Yeah. They're, now, they're now it's a different regime. Yeah. And it, he was saying now he's finding more relaxing in the team than he did at Brooks. Yeah. If I remember that correctly from Mr. Yesterday. Yeah, Whereas yeah. these guys, they were on edge the whole time. I um, mean, both of the results I'm not saying she's right or wrong but it's quite interesting listening to the comparison yeah, yeah I mean years it, ago it, it to, was, to now it was the hardest thing. I don't know what, Al, Al, what you thought but it was the hardest thing so like for example like Tom James DJ you know he and I were in the team for ages I think he's one of the you know, he's a fantastic rower we seriously respected each other we really got along but like you know we knew it was me or him the whole time mm. and um, you've got this you've got this crazy dichotomy where but I knew if I was in a boat with him, I wanted him to be as good as he possibly could be, right? So when he's suffering on the ergo, on you know the bad days, I'm going up to him, uh, and the same vice versa. But then you're 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 seat racing, you know, three days later, and you're not talking to each other, and you're basically telling, you know, I'm telling out, right? Just you know, pull hard for me, don't pull hard for him, you know, or uh, or, or whatever. And then it's hard. You only have one. You only have one one run in you anyway. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 It was like, who wants out first? In the boat. <laughs> exactly. You yeah, guys yeah. got the juice. I definitely. <laughs> I, I there was a pair. There was a pairs matrix. There was a pairs matrix in Seville in 2000, 2004 and uh, there were some stroke sides like you had Rick down to Kieran West and a couple others. And I got pulled into this, and that was how I got my uh, pretty much how I got my seat in the four. And it was like, oh, you know, who do you want first? And I was like, I'll take Kieran. <laughs> I'll take Kieran. And like, he just like blasted down the course. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so how late did you come into the team then before 08? You just did one season? Um, 2007. Uh, I think I did 18 months. Yeah, I'm not even that. You well, I'm pushing you and Robin off up in Boston and have had some trials in what both were in your... You could look parachute when suddenly you're going to be wearing an army lever pushing you off and you would take a piss out of Robin. And that would have been December 06. Because Banksy was, I was working here for Banksy. And I remember saying to Banksy, yeah. if you put that army pair in the stern pair of your ape, they'll go a lot faster. Ooh, didn't say. Then it got stern pair, put a medal. Yeah. So yeah, I probably did 18 months in the team. I think, yeah, I think um, I could have. He was captain salary at the same time, I might add, as his uh, talking about Alex saying he felt like a bit of a fraud <laughs> walking around doing his hobby. There was Al Kate, the British Army captain, and on National Lottery Fund. No, he wasn't. He wasn't funded. <laughs> he wasn't funded. I wasn't funded then. Were you not funded at all? No. He must have after me. You were. After me. You were. Yeah, I was. Yeah, you, you were not in 07. No, not in 07. No, no, after me. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Um, but after, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're right. And then did the, did the Army use you for. Uh, well, to, I mean, they, they, they just supported. I mean, to be honest, I, I had given them six, six and a half years, um, where I'd done everything. I, you know, I, I didn't take any time out. And actually, I had, um, because at the time I was working down in, um, uh, in Lulworth at a, at the armored, armored gunnery school. And I was the 30 millimeter, what a title for a job, 30 millimeter gunner instructor. And <laughs> course officer or something like that. <laughs> you wouldn't mean anything to anyone. <clears throat> and it's a, it's a skill that's good loss now because they don't even use that weapon anymore. <laughs> oh, um, so, but anyway, like I, I was down there with, with Robin and we were training. Uh, I mean, he said, oh, you know, it's a very long story. This, but, um, <clears throat> he said, oh, you know, I was, I knew who it was when he, so I used to instruct all sorts of people, whether it was a soldier to up to like colonels, because they had something to do with that particular kind of weapon. It was on a tank and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so people come through, and one day Robin came through on the young officer's course, and um, and he was like, "Oh yeah, you know, if to get in the British team, you know, I'll see trainers air, and I want to pair as partner, and I need someone." And he's like, "What do you want to?" And I just, I mean, I just laughed at him. I was like, "You know, this is just never gonna happen." But okay, 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was the kind of weird thing. It. Was, it's, it's an impossible it's situation. Like, I'm in. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to do it. Yo. <laughs> and um, anyway, so we, we kind of started training together. Johnny Singfield was our coach. Yeah, I think it's just, uh, you know, amazing. Brilliant. Yeah. I know we've laughed a few times before um, about people sort of saying that you can't accidentally get to the Olympics. And it sort of yeah, sounds yeah, like yeah. you have. It's sort of like <laughs> ripped up on something and then. Like, I'm on the start line. <laughs> While hating hey, but, the sport and not on the way. But, but, but in, 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 you know, in, in kind of, but the, anyway, the point about the, like, did the, the army look, you know, how do they support you? Mm. Um, so I, so they, they basically, I mean, it's actually fair. They were like, okay, you got to, tr- you got to work full time for the army until the point where the British team say to us, can you release this person to come and train full time? And then I think we, I can't remember where we came in the, in the, in the long distance trial, but anyway, it was within the top seven pairs. Maybe fifth, sixth. Um, and, um, they were like, and then Jürgen was like, look, can you, you know, put me in touch with your, you know, the colonel of the regiment, whatever. And, they, and then they said, yeah, okay, well, you've got, you've got, you know, you've got as, as long as it takes up to the Olympics. And if you get to the Olympics, then great. But if, if you don't, the minute, the minute you don't, you know, achieve something and they don't want you there anymore, you've got to come straight back and go to Afghanistan or Iraq or whatever. And so, you know, there was that double pressure because you were like, well, it's going to look embarrassing if I go off telling everyone in the army, yeah, we're going to go to the Olympics. And, and then I'm back like two months later or something. And, it would just look, yeah, it would just be embarrassing. And then my, my uh, I can say this because I don't know where he is or who he is anymore because I can't remember his name. But um, my sergeant, who was like my 2IC for my course, he was a shippy guy. And he was like, you, yeah, Mr. Esker, like, you'll never get anywhere in rowing. Like, you just, you can't, even, I can beat you on that because we said a BFT, it's called the basic fitness test. And he was a runner. And he was always like, I can all, I, I'll beat you every time. It's really chippy. I'll beat you every time on that test. And I was like, I don't really care about this running thing. And rowing, you're probably no better at that either. And uh, if you if you get in the Olympics, I'll eat my berry. I'll, I'll sit here in the tank park and everyone can watch me. You can watch me eat my berry. I'll cut it up and eat piece by piece. And I remember crossing that line at the, uh, at all the Olympics and thinking, when am I going to arrange this time to move back? And it was like the thing that was spurring me on. I was like, I can't wait to get back to England. Get down to Lower, get all the sergeants around, chop, chop, chop that berry up, make him eat it. <laughs> Did he? Well, he wasn't there. While wearing your Olympic medal. But yeah, anyway, anyway but the, yeah, the, the army were amazing. They just were like, you yeah, know, this is beneficial to the army for recruits yeah, and whatever. And as well as, you know, and, 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 and they were like, when you finish, you know, come back. And uh, I'm Robin went straight to Afghanistan, I mean, like three weeks later or something. Wow. And one of Queen's Gallantry Cross for bravery out there. Yeah, you know, amazing. Really bloody amazing. No, he uh, done three weeks, but it was like, but I mean, yeah, well, I mean, he did a train, but I mean, I mean it was all he wanted time. to go as quick as he could. He almost went straight, straight there. Um, That's it. Uh, we sort of spoke briefly with Ben saying that um, Leander owns. Yeah, Robin Bourne Taylor and Alan Davies. Yeah. Two um, of his biggest garage crosses. Two of how many that were awarded? Yeah. Two out of 40 from this club. Bob Rowe and Davies. 40 in the world. No, four, there were 40 awarded in Afghanistan at um, 12 years and two. It's quite, it's one of, it's a very new award, isn't it? No, it's like, but, um, but, is, you, yeah, two of them from this club, which is pretty good. Game, so, at any point after getting an Olympic silver medal, did you think, "Oh, this rowing is actually quite fun. I, I might be enjoying this a little yeah, bit." Oh my god, it made me even hate it even more. <laughs> I mean, I mean uh, yeah. no, I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I could feel good. myself. You know, I, I, I you're yeah. mastered around in the army a lot. Like, there is nothing in the army physically that is in any way like biomechanics looked after and that you're just smashed to pieces the whole time there's no like physio or anything like this so i could really feel <clears throat> i could really feel myself like with the training load like suffering like it's just you know wear and tear you know my like my knees and my, my ankles are, 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 are ruined at the moment and like i've got a back injury and that was from the army and then that didn't get any better and i just thought you know if i if i feel like if i did one more season even not even a season like hot, i would just break i mean i was at that physical point where you're like i just can't but the training but also like the training that we did i mean I'm, I'm not saying that any of the training that the team does now but i think the training that we did with jürgen back in 08 you know it was brutal because like it was just every ergo was what score are you getting you know, every single, so like, there was like no steady, you know, state. And every time you're on the water, I mean, Al was really good on the water, right? And great to repair, but you know, you need to get stuff where your nose is in front. So you'd be paddling steady state and be like, Beep. 
you know, yeah. we'd be just absolutely hosing, you know, uh, all the other pairs. And um, so your body was just on that kind of thin, thin, you know, thin red line. Uh, it was brutal back then. Yeah, so I remember brutal. doing like a, a 16K, young night, go downstairs, do your 16K, steady state, ergo. And I would sit next to like Pete, Pete Reed, and uh, he'd be like putting 146. And I was like, well, I need to be better than that. So I'm going to get 145.5. And I was like redlining it for 16k on a Tuesday, like before lunch, with, and there was no one even in the room. Like, I'm like, what am I doing? You yeah, know. And then I'm absolutely ruined for the rest of the week. And it's just that mentality was like, yeah, it's just how it's ridiculous. When the, the coach point? is like, "This is a proper UT2 ergo. Everyone just UT2." And oh, by the way, here's the sheet, and you're all going to put your name and yeah. your score up, and then I'm going to look at it afterwards, and I'm probably yeah. going to congratulate whoever went the fastest. But it's just UT2. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> that's exactly. <laughs> Like, you know, going back to, you were talking, Matt, or you had Matt Aldridge on here on the um, podcast the other day, and he's a fantastic, I'm so pleased for them. Mm. Um, but he still haven't gone below 545 yet in the, uh, uh, on the water. So, but, you know, we'll see see how fast they can get. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, you know, and, and the kind of, the culture and team and stuff, like, we had such a brutal intensity. And from from coming from, you know, oh, that's one of the things I really struggled with because I was at Brooks with these guys. And when we went rowing, it was so much fun. I mean, the bus journey down was hilarious. And the bus journey back, if you got work, we're alive. <laughs> I think around Gold Ball or around that. Yeah. And, you know, was, and our, our trips, and, and we trained hard together, but it was such a laugh. And we trained hard and we played even harder. And Al was like one of the best. Uh, Al and Ben were one of the best. In fact, I shared a house, didn't you? No, uh, no, 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 no. He was with Aiden. Uh, 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 right. No, you didn't know. Well, I was living with John. I definitely didn't. Oh, uh, right. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, but like, uh, and it was just brilliant. I love rowing with these guys at Brooks. And, but, you know, up to, um, from, from 2000, when I got onto the team in 2001, uh, you know, I was in there with like Dan Oosley and, um, uh, you know, Joe Maltzen, Jono, Andy Hodge, you know, but, like there was just no fun. You know, it was just not fun at all. I, me- I remember we held a Christmas, you know, the the one party we held of the year was like the Christmas party after everyone had done the 2K at, at our house. And like I was in bed by eight o'clock because um, I had tonsillitis, you know, straight away after the year ago. And, you know, that was my whole Christmas written up. And there was just no, you know, and everyone was left by half nine um uh so, and and I, and I remember you know I, I enjoyed the progress but i just remember like the total silence in the crew room in hammersmith you know there's the cold dank wet room upstairs in the gym there you know down in, in, in hammersmith boat house the ara um and just like the terrible food and no banter like just zero it was basically like the Oxford people slagging off the Cambridge people. It's like it's Kieran West, Tom Stallard, Ben Birch, and uh, Robert Boar Taylor. Oh, in the boat race. Ah, rah, 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 rah. You know, I just sat there like, this is rubbish. Um, and we were going slow. We just went backwards. And then, yeah. and it was a bit better. Robin was, you know, quite, you know, Robin and I had rode together as juniors, but it got a bit better when he was there. Um, but like Jono from Brooks, from the Brooks days, Jono Devlin, you know, an awesome guy, but like super quiet, right? Well, super and quiet. Joe well, and Joe Von Moulton, not like super yeah. quiet guy. And so like you'd gone from this such hilarious, awesome, fun atmosphere to rowing down there where it was just like so bleak. And then through 2004, you know, uh, okay, I, I got better, but like I just it wasn't really enjoying it. And then I had the whole big thing. But so the 2005, you know, we were winning and stuff, but still like just really lacking that fun. So when Sal got in the team in 2007, I was like, it was like, you know, someone, it was fun and funny again. And then I remember, because I'd been rowing in that four with Pete and Andy and Steve, you know, Steve Williams, super serious guy, super quiet. I heard, I think Mo said that if there was like a bad session, he wouldn't sit in the crew room, he'd go and sit in his car. Yeah. Yeah, or if you lost, you know, you didn't hear from him for like three months. I remember like Steve, 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 oh, this, it was on a night out, but, you know, Steve came up to me and he was like, oh, you know, um, when we rode in a pair together for three years, and he's like, you know, you and I never really saw eye to eye. And I was like, what? And he goes, yeah, we never saw eye to eye. And I was like, I was like, well, mate, if you had told me, I would have done something about it. I thought we were getting on fine. But, you know, that's probably also my fault. 
But anyway, so I was in that four, super serious. Pete was super serious. Andy was, you know, pretty laid back. And then I lost my place in the four and I came into the eight. And it was just like this massive, like, relief, breath of fresh air, right? With like Al and then, you know, Robin was in the eight and Josh West and, um, I, you know, just thought Tom Lucy. And, and the first thing we did is we made a. <laughs> And, and the first video, thing we did is we went out in London. Your brother's music. So you, you went out in London. So, so remember that? I, I, I thought this is going to be so serious. And no, no, but we did it. After crazy. No, this is way before that. This is like right when we. I feel it was right when we saw him. We went out in London to John West's house. And oh, I didn't know that was before I was in the eight. That was before. That was a year before. Oh, uh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I was like, and I, I was like, and it was just. You know, these guys who, I mean, often, probably never, it, it felt like no one had ever been out to a pub before, <laughs> or like, to a nightclub or anything. And uh, I was just like, this, I've been, you know, I've been drinking with, like, soldiers, like, paras in, like, Catterick. And, you know, that, what they got, like, this is nothing like that. Like, this is another level. And it was just carnage. I just couldn't believe the behavior that was going on. I was like, this is just, you know, anyway. But I'm, but, and I, so I thought, actually, you know, but I could, I could probably do this. There aren't many opportunities to let, no, but I mean, let the pressure bow off. Well, from zero to a thousand. Yeah, I think that's rare. So I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't have carried on um, after 2008 unless I got into that eight. Yeah. Um, and had the, I remembered, it reminded me why I love rowing again. And it was fun. Every hour thing was fun. I think the point of rowers nights out are insane. I mean, Al, the general manager of this place, will know come Saturday, Sunday, Henry. I'm denying that now. Very serious. Very serious, yes. Well, uh, <laughs> Brother Al saying that Rose on a night out is a level above Parrot on a night out. Probably just Parrot's out a bit more. Doesn't strike in the slight. Yes, because there's only bridge. like three opportunities, isn't it? So when you go, you go. Yeah, this is yeah. pretty wild. <laughs> yeah. All I'm saying, all I'm saying is the importance of uh, just enjoying, you know, I think you get, you are so much better. When you enjoy them, what you do. I think the guys in the team now, it seems now, yeah. not so obviously that Jürgen, you know, these results, you can't, but like, normally it was a very interesting guy to talk to. He never coached me, he coached you guys. Um, but now it seems like they're trying to get the balance mm. right a little bit more. The, you know, all just talking about it. I know um, uh, before you were in, in 2010, you're trying to make it a bit more. Oh, we had fun, yeah. We are trying to use social media and all the rest of it to say, look, we are doing what we love. So you, that's something the best you keep hearing when you're. Yeah. Just, you're privileged enough to do something you love. You also need to enjoy it. You've got to enjoy the process. And I says one of the things that like, I, I was broken. I shied away from the team a bit. But I, just, you know, I knew I'd break. I wouldn't last. I wasn't really very big. But it's like, it doesn't look like an awful lot. It's a bit of it. There's a sense of like, I'm in the national team now. I have to take this so seriously. Like I remember when I first came to Leander thinking, like, I'm going to have to be like so serious every day. And then I happened to bump into Owen and Wilco. I think I said this before. Like, right? They just... There was two of them. They were. I I got introduced to them like literally the first day I came down, and they were they were just looking at photos from pub golf at the weekend, and uh, <laughs> Owen had been doing some yeah. disgusting things. <laughs> so yeah, they did, oh, that was quite nice to sort of feel like, oh okay, like we'll take the rowing seriously, but we'll still. I think the guys are gross. Still, I we went out a lot. Let's be honest. Yeah, probably too much. But I think now they they still. I think all three hours smoked, smoked while we were right. <laughs> like a fussy Yeah, just we did. Um, I do know Brad and I having a lot of beers and then rocking up to trials after about three hour things. We did quite well. If we stopped getting pissed every week, we could do really quite well. But it never happened. I think I'll so. Left it. Yeah, yeah, but wait, right, look, I think I think you, we're it's still great. painting it's the like wrong saying, picture. Right? Painting the wrong picture of like it's not about it's not about just getting pissed out, but it's about just having an absolute laugh, like doing silly things like you know uh, we, yeah that, that that was what i loved them it wasn't because like you can barely remember the, the nights out right but you can remember that you know where you remember we had that water water bottle uh hot water bottle uh competition to see who could blow it up uh the most in the minibus on the that way back. belgian hand yeah it's a belgian hand yeah, yeah well, well, i think you just i think you just i i think it's more about the kind of atmosphere i mean i think maybe it's the coaches or the system or something i don't know yeah. but like unless you're given unless you are given like they need to create an environment where you feel like you're not being unduly pressured the whole time by the, the whole method of the system and i think it can completely pass you by maybe as a coach i don't know you don't realize the impact you're having on everyone if yeah, yeah. you're creating this like environment of just pressure so and it's just not it just seeds like 
just concern and an- anxiety and you know a hundred percent so i think yeah i think that also the interesting point then is like to so can to compare that to the army obviously sort of sport really is kind of like a safe war isn't it in some respect um mm. and you have that camaraderie and all those things so if you compare that to like obviously the british army like how do they get that thing right especially in an even more well, high, 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 high pressure more intense so there you go did you did you run it as you would have run a company <laughs> <laughs> yeah 16 year old 16 yeah. year old Rowan is exactly <laughs> like <laughs> the bell you have to ring the bell at latimer if you're gonna uh yeah, yeah but i mean like there's a fun aspect to that you know if you're like trying to you know when you're a kid when you're a kid like as a boy you know and, what do you do? You play, like, you know, fake war stuff. Every and fresh and fresh. And, like, and like, the idea yeah. of the army is really fun. And, yeah. like, obviously, there's this, obviously, it's not, a, not all fun and games. But, um, hey, but, I mean, like, I think the army side of things is, I mean, I like a sort of camaraderie like you've never seen because that's what it's all based on. And, you know, the whole idea that you kind of look after each other and da 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 da. And that is so the seed is sown from day one and and a lot of these things i think just happen because naturally because if you want to agree for people you spend a lot of time together you do something really horrible together then that creates the camaraderie on its own you don't need to do anything to make that happen because you know if you your mates in your university i mean if I compare that to people I was at university with where there was no and none of this, but we all went out and we had lots of fun together the whole time and da 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 I'm talking about Newcastle here, but um, you know, you didn't actually, you know, go through this. I'm f- far more kind of um you know, I have far more lifelong friends from the army side of things because we didn't go out and do all these things. I mean we did eventually, you know, when you get off training or whatever, but we spent a lot of time doing some horrendous things and being cold wet hungry and he ruined and blah, 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 blah. and that kind of experience doing that together is like getting out of your bed and that, that, but that's that's what i think you know that i do think that rowing does create that it's not that anywhere like as you know they're not no, that's <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 that is what creates that but like when i suppose but like it, what i think so, so like what the I coach was, is getting out of the way of yeah what i think gonna, yeah what i think is uh what i think is and this is what I think, I really believe the best athletes, if you listen, when I was listening to Eric Murray's podcast the other day, you know, they are in control of the process. They are in control of their input. You know, when I look back at my best times in the team, when I was in the eight with you, um, I felt we were driving what we were doing. We had as just as much say as John and Mark, uh, John West and Mark Banks. When I was in the four, uh, you know, in 2004, when I was with Matt, James and Steve, I felt like I had an equal share of the say. Well, in fact, they changed loads to to for, for what I wanted to do. And I think Matt, when Matt and Steve Redgrave were together, they drove it, right? Jürgen basically provided the framework, but they drove how they wanted to do it. Same with Andy and Pete when they were at their best in the four. You know, Alex Gregory, you know, when uh, Alex Gregory talks about the four in 20, you know, the 2016, you know, it basically Jürgen just like let them go and they just go out and row they wouldn't say a word they knew exactly what they wanted to do they would drive how they did it come in bosh they they ran they ran the show and that's what i think in the army you know you're trained how to do it it's, you know we all got the basics right now you're going to go and execute yourself and you go through those hardships and those are the things that create the, where 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 it where it's the worst and where the worst environment is where you just feel like your autonomy is taken away from you right where you're just a number and and that's the situation and that's the situation that I felt in quite a lot of the team because I was always under selection pressure. Am I going to be in the four? Am I going to be in the eight? Or da da da, you know. And I was just all right. Where do I fit? Who who do who does Jurgen want to use me for at the moment? Right, I'm rowing with Rick because you know I need to get Rick to go faster in the pair. Or I'm rowing now. Okay, now I'm rowing with Noddy. You know, um, uh, and, and you know, like well, who had previously rowed with Jesus. You know, um, <laughs> can we tell that story really quickly? Uh, yeah, we can tell that story. So I'm got so basically early, early, early. I don't know if you guys know this story. So early in the winter, Jurgen always used to like to make it really difficult for me because I'd normally come back pretty fat and unfit. And uh, so instead of being able, to you work, never learn. You never learn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In the decade you're in, the cross the finish, cross the finish line at 91 kilos. Come back straight, any hundred and ten years, <laughs> you know, and uh, and and um, and so like so, you know, we were all, we were all put in pairs and stuff, 
And I'd normally row with Alex and Andy had had an injury or basically he wanted to row a single because he didn't want to row with Pete at that time or something like that. And um, and so I, I um, you're good, okay, the pair, blah, 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 Matt Langridge, Rick, you know, Pete, uh, Alex. And then it was like everyone else. And then it was like all the two people left standing on the bank. It's like, okay, Alex, uh, you are with uh, that, that naughty. And I was like, what? <laughs> okay. Anyway, so like I was fine. I'd made up my mind at that point that I didn't care who I was going to row with. I didn't care what boat I was in. I was going to make that boat win, win the Olympic Games. And, uh, and I went out in the pair and it was kind of, you know, it started going, it was not that great to begin with, but then we got better and better. And uh, all right, not, and we we get to the finish of the 2K course in Caversham. And all he's like, oh, 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 you just done this, it's not going like this. And I, and I just went, I was like, I just turned around and I went, Roddy, I don't know who the fuck you've been riding with, but it must be either, uh, it must be either Jesus <laughs> or Tompkins <laughs> because this is coming pretty bloody well and we've won every single piece in the last three weeks so I don't know how you who it is but can you just have a check with yourself and realize this is going pretty well and he went oh uh, okay okay and then you know it was you know it was quiet from then the cup half sentence isn't it yeah yeah it's another oh, story. But everyone, everyone like, apparently, because everyone was like the thing, and I was like, I don't know who you but it must be Jesus. <laughs> it's a story that fed down. So, like, yeah, we I wasn't in the team at that time at Leander, but, like, this kind of story, like, all came through. Yeah. Like, oh, Alex then, turned around and shouted uh, at Noddy. And then uh, and then we raced the, the Winter Trials, which is, I think, the one they're going back to do now. And uh, and it was Pete and Alex and, uh, and, and, you know, it was Mo and, you know, all the big guys. And uh, and Naughty and I just basically stonk it out the start. We're we're leading at at fifteen hundred gone. And I was like, oh my god, we're gonna win win to try the win with, with Naughty. And then I was like, oh my, that, that could be dangerous, you know. And uh, and then and then <laughs> and I just blew my doors off, <laughs> blew my absolute doors off the boat, like going across the lake. And then Andy, uh, Pete and uh, Pete and Alice just go, Beep! and it goes right through us. So luckily, uh, we didn't. Went, but you know. I back to your point about having been of ownership. I obviously don't know what it's like in the army, but I use Nelly's form in 2016. I get in the training program, program right, go and get on with it. Because you, when you push the crew off, they look after themselves. Because mm. you guys know, you know, know coaching, that's just when you become the most nervous, you can't do anything. Giving the, letting the crew have a lot of ownership, I think, is absolutely key. Yeah, it's so absolutely key. In my final year in the team, I was really struggling and I uh, went to see the psychologist. And kind of listed off how I felt and the things that were happening, and he was like, "Yeah, you've you pretty much just ticked every box on what would make someone not feel part of the team and not feel motivated." I was like, "Oh, like can we do something about it? nah?" <laughs> Jurgen's not interested in changing anything. So this, no, this is the thing you don't need to treat athletes like kids. Like you're working with adults, they know how to move the boat. They know what feels fast, what feels good, what feels comfortable. They know how to be accountable. So. I think autonomy is, is a big thing. And also to add to Al's point, like I don't think there's anything that brings two people closer together than suffering together, going through something like in the army. Like same thing with rowing. You can like not see someone for two, three, four, five years. Mm. And it's like, yeah. you know, a minute's I gone think, by. I think, you, you made, to us, I, think that, I think that point's really well. I think, and, and not that I noticed this. Well, I kind of noticed it a bit, but and I don't want to turn this to turn into like a new old age. You know why not? But I'm um, well, right, fine. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just feel like a lot of, I, th I think this is fed in a lot through like, um, you hear it in football and 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 just in a lot of kind of professional sport. It there is you know it's all people talk a lot about like getting that extra like naught point naught one second and how you're going to do that and uh, it, you know every single thing you do or you can give that athlete is going to add not and yeah you know maybe it does right. But I think the priorities are completely skewed because the the kind of the at the mental side of it is driven by going through adversity, being tough, and being and having the experience of going through tough things. Yeah, that will provide you with far more um, benefit than oh well, you know, close I, I, I want like yeah, I want, I want the right kind of you know environment. I want the right mood lighting in my gym and, and I want, you know, I want this heating and I want heating. I want hot water. I mean, ridiculous. <laughs> uh, but I mean, just, just some of these, water. I just think this, I think what it is, I feel there's this like attitude where like luxuries or sort of tiny, tiny little things 
are going to benefit, but that is skewed the wrong way. It's like, yes, they probably can, and there's no reason you shouldn't ha have that. But like on the flip side, you should not underestimate the benefit of having to go through some really, really tough things that are very, very unpleasant. And there is that kind of complete dichotomy there because it's like, well, uh, uh, you know, uh, we're not, we can't just go into like some sort of, you know, futuristic type, you know, gym scenario where you're being carried to the physio bench and every single thing is being looked after by, because that in itself is like contrary to going through this tough stuff. And like, as an athlete, you've got to kind of work out that like, you know, on one side, there's all these sort of benefits from science that can sort of add 0.0001%. But then the mental side of it is nothing to do with science, you know? Yeah, I saw hard. still have to do the suffering. Yeah, I saw yeah. on a... on a things what you're trying to say. Isn't it? Yeah. On another podcast, they were really talking good. about <laughs> if uh, if you were in, in charge of creating the, the perfect athlete, what situations would you put them through in order in order to achieve that? And it wouldn't be an easy ride. Pretty grueling. And as much as you always, like, we all do it. We all look at someone who'd had an easier ride or, you know, they had a bit more money or their parents gave us more money or they had their own single or all those things. Oh, I wish I had that. I wish I had that. I wish I had the easier ride. But then forgetting at the same time that all the struggles you'll go through is what's creating Yeah, I mean, you know, the reality is like, okay, right. So, you know, money, without a doubt, like, makes a difference, right? It yeah. provides you the time to train. Right. without having to work and the time to recover without so money makes a difference 100 percent. but if you don't do the miles and you don't do the suffering and you don't do the time in the gym doesn't matter what money you have you're not going anywhere um and i you know i i agree with that like you know I, i'm you know it's all it's all nice to have a nice culture and, and i guess you know you you can you, you can win when you're really unhappy and when it's really rubbish and you can win when you're really happy, right? Um, it's just you come out of it thinking slightly different things, right? Um, and and so, and maybe maybe being maybe being happy and having a good time may, may make you go a little bit faster, but maybe hating everyone else in the world because how hard it is for you, and just like just having the pure like venom. Also, you know, like I often Jurgen would like put me in situations where it you know he knew like it would piss me off, mm. and me pissed off was an angry me was a driven me and you did not want to get on the wrong side of that like i would i would you know go to the i would go to the start line of the race and i'd be like i'm gonna i am going to kill my opposite number like i'm going to smoke this fool into the ground and make him never ever want to race me again that's my that was my attitude um and uh and and so like a piss off me was a fast me and he's worked that out yeah and he yeah. worked that out and and so he created the situations and the scenarios because he knew a, like a happy me potentially was a lazy if I'd known that I'd have pissed you off a lot more <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> <that's> <laughs> yeah I just, just annoyed you right? yeah, that's another one that would be interesting like again to get from the army perspective I was sort of pride myself on my ability to suffer yeah I can really like absolutely end myself knowing that there's a hot shower and cook breakfast in five minutes you know and like yeah i can end myself knowing that i get to go home at four o'clock and have a nap but like compare that to the army where you're working really really hard but then you don't have that stuff yeah like what's that difference no i mean it's it, it is is you that is actually a really good point i mean it's so you know the comparison is just so different like the like as you say you know you could spend spend 10 days in like um or Senny Bridge in Wales, in and it's winter and it's minus five every night and it's sideways blizzard, and I'd have to like we do I don't know the whole day doing something uh, really onerous and very very tough and physical, and then I know like there isn't any of that I'm I'm just gonna have to get warm and I'll have to put another layer on, and and hope that the other one gets dry but it won't because it's so cold mm. so you end up and then it rains and it and it freezes and you've got to dig a shell scrape which is what you sleep in and it fills up with water and i'm sleeping in cold water like i'm trying to sleep in cold water i mean that kind of thing you know I, it is a completely different thing you're right and then you think oh my god i've got to this to this you know i've got the british team and I'm training and this is seriously i'm pleasant you're absolutely right you're like i'm never gonna have to sleep in a cold trench ever again i mean i literally can go home to my house and I was, you're right that kind of feet I think that's unfortunately it's like there is hard training and adversity in training which is obvious but that's very internalized because 
that is your own personal experience. Yes, you can see other people suffering over there, but like it's never more than whenever. I mean, the longest thing you do is the only thing you do that's really painful and horrible is probably 5K, right? You know, everything else, yeah, yeah we're half out. But, um, but, but in that short period of time, but you don't spend days and days and days. Like, and I can see, you know, where I can, if it's minus five, I just know everyone's suffering. I don't know whether he's pulling us, he's feeling like I am on the ergo. I think I'm suffering more than he is because he's an extra 30 kilos, you know. And I say, you know, it's, it's all that kind of like, I know that with the kind of environment and the adversity of the environment, then everyone's having a shit time. But then that builds like confidence in your ability every time you like get through it. Like, so then, so well, you just know you're not going to die, you know. I think to Spratley was a like, oh, no He was like, you're not going to die. And like, no, he's still going in the, the, the army. I was like, Shit, I mean, like, I might actually die in the army. So, yeah, he had a good point. Yeah, that's, so that, that was, <laughs> yeah, Spratley was, he was really yeah. good. Like, no one is going to die out there. Yeah. So like that was the, my, I, I, I still remember this day. That was my biggest breakthrough in rowing as a kid. It's when I realized that when I was racing, no matter how painful it got, I wasn't going to die. <laughs> like, so I was like, I can go even harder and feel even more pain. That's a bit of a Brooks mentality there. At least I'm not going to die. <laughs> no, that, that first time and, uh, you get into that third 500 and and you kind of scare yourself, don't you? Like, yeah, I didn't oh, get shit, third I'm... 500. I was at 750 gone. <laughs> <laughs> I was <laughs> checking well, out. <laughs> Guys, I, I'm, I'm going to have to go. <laughs> no, that's it's absolutely fine. fine. I really appreciate your time. Uh, it's been really uh, been really interesting to get a little bit of a different aspect on it. But, we'll, yeah, we can just, just keep, can keep going on with the two. There was any, yeah, I, just, yeah. Al, yeah, I was going to say, is that, Al, if there's any, like, um, best bit of advice to someone that you that was going to either go. Yeah, no, no, like, like someone, whether, whether, they're, when they're, whether they're in the, in the team, whether they're in the team, and, they, yeah, this is the Olympic year coming up, um, uh, any bit of advice you'd give that individual about, you know, maybe that you you wish that, that you think could could have transferred the silver to gold, or you know, maybe for anyone you know not getting a medal into. Yeah, I think I think I think I mean you probably sort of glean some of this from. I mean, this is not to say that I think you know when 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 I, when I was actually on the water, I you know I, there's no there's not one time that I wouldn't have tried to be as the best I could possibly be the entire time. So despite all this nonsense I'm talking about, like actually the sport of rowing, you know, done for a very, very long time and I, you know, pride myself on wanting to be technically really good and that, that was the thing that kind of drove me. Whereas I think on the land training side of things, my advice would be like, I, I definitely kind of, I think probably so I tired half the time, but like I know that if I just, thought about what the training session was trying to achieve whether it was weights or whatever else it was and then kind of put that effort in to make the most out of that particular session it would have afforded me a lot more benefit because i always felt the only thing worth doing was actually going on the water and rowing and rowing hard and whatever and when it came to training session it became like it was like a onerous task for me rather than something that was going to benefit me and I, that was my mentality the entire time. So whether it's an ergo or a weight session, whatever, I would always do it with, with a slight, like, mm, go half-hearted, no, I'll get through it. But then on the water, I was like, right, this is it. This is what it's all about. Whereas actually, you know, I would be like, every single thing that you do has the benefit and you need to put you up, pretty soon. Put, put, put everything into it. But I, I love how you like, you say that, looking back with reflection of, you know, sitting next to you on the ergo many times at altitude, that you're half-hearted with you being pulled off the ergo, put on an oxygen mask. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's because I, I smoked. That's because I smoked for seven years in the army. <laughs> I mean, I had lungs. You were like this <laughs> packet. <laughs> you know, that's why it was that's the bloody smoking that did it. But um, but no, I mean, like th that. You know, uh, as an example, I'll give you one example. I remember that, that, you know, the, the, when we had to go to Bisham Abbey and do our weight sessions, and I was like, that's some, well, I felt it's like a stupid warm up, which is basically a circuit session. And I would literally, like, the minute, like, the, the guy who's running the sessions back to turn, I was just like, not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> or I just, you know, I was just like, what are we doing here? Like, let's go rowing, you know? Yeah. And it was, and that, I think that really, you know, you've got to, you've got to treat everything as an, with uh, the same importance. So I, I was the complete opposite. 
I, I would say. I, was, I mean, as in like everything on the gym. Right. No, I love going. Right. <laughs> it's good to know that now. I but you like doing weights, yeah. <laughs> everything I did was to the. Uh, to, 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 but I would say to the over intensity, like. You know, I remember doing bench pulls at uh, at uh, Brooks next to you, Ben, and you know we put it on more weight, and I'd be going like the competition, and I'd, I'd literally be visualizing. I'd be like, you know, um, right, what would you know Matthew Pinson do? Like, where I'm in the Olympic final, I I can do one more lift. You know, I can do this. Like every single ergo I did was so focused. I mean, I was shattered, absolutely like mentally broken every day because I was just concentrated so hard, and actually sometimes you just needed to let it flow. I think for all the geniuses, one well, of the geniuses that I coach that are maybe watching this down the line, that's a very good bit of advice. Yeah, basically, there's no not that much point in trying to follow the science and get chase the one thousandth of a second of a percent and train in always perfect conditions, perfect heating, perfect mood light, because you're going to go out there and it's choppy. What are you going to do? You're fucked. If you only learn how to row in like clean water, no waves, nothing, the conditions aren't always going to be perfect. So you need that bit of suffering. You need that bit of mental resilience that you develop, like going through those things. Because then you, you need to be really versatile when it comes to race day. Back in the it's under pressure, isn't it? I mean, once, you know, it's, you said out there, well, it could be pretty horrendous. You then turn on a nice flat lake and then you come here to Henley. I oh did, window going stream, it's absolutely ringing. It's semi, you know, it, it all goes out the window. Josh and I were having a discussion the other day, uh, working with Josh, and we were discussing carbon wing versus metal wing. It's like, I don't think much difference at all. I'm sure someone's done Stevie T probably. He looks into this stuff as Cambridge. Someone's probably done it. When it boils down to it, how much difference does it actually make? I don't I World Championships, dead flat, maybe, but they've all got the same equipment anyway. Out here, I don't think makes any difference. Yeah, I think I really don't. Yeah. I mean, I think having um yeah, I, I, I really like the Kiwi program and where the Kiwis train in Carapiro. And I think having a late and you know, they have rough conditions and they have and can, amazing yeah. well more more than that yeah. um they have but they can also have incredibly flat you know conditions and i think i think you talk about doing the basics right you've got to learn how to do the basics really really well and have those conditions to be able to create that pattern to then take into the tough conditions um uh and and then ex just keep executing the same thing over and over and over again you know i remember james cracknell was like you know, before the 2004 final, we were in a dialogue, um, you know, with him in Athens and me stuck back here because my collapse lung, you know, and and, I, and 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 he was like, you know, super nervous before the final. And I was like, you're not going to go, you're not, you're only going out there to do exactly the same thing that you've done in training thousands and thousands of times again. Um, but yeah, so like, I, but I think, yeah, I think you need to go, I think you need to create a program where you create enough challenge and toughness for mentally tough pressure right like so the selection pressure that is created in the british team is is good because it's it the pressure you feel on the olympic the start on the olympic final is super intense so you need to be able to have that pressure in training in training situations in testing um uh so that you and you have executed those basics under that pressure mm. and the pressure that you feel in the olympics is is even more even more that it's different um uh, and and what i always felt and i think what most of the guys i rode with under jurgen is we felt like that there, there there was nothing else we could have done in training we we trained harder than everybody else and jurgen would say to us oh yeah you know just remember remember Zilretta, remember Zirga, you know, just remember, you know, these times. Um, and you would look back, like, I remember, I remember, um, I remember, you know, being uh, on um, Ergos in Japan uh, well, for the World, world Champs um, uh, in... Um, Gifu? Gifu, yeah, Gifu, in 05. In 05. Yeah. And I remember racing the heat having done these ergo pieces at rate 26 in a samurai warrior gym you know wooden gym at like 70 percent humidity you know 38 degrees it hotter than the sun and i remember finishing the heat of the world champs um and being like those ergos were harder yeah those ergos were that i did two days before yeah. the worlds and i was still tired 
um, and it was easier than that. And I think I think the other the other thing I you know I just wanted to say is that like I was just thinking about it just now you know like um, you were talking about autonomy. I think that the best athletes in, that I can think of in the world, Tim Foster, you know, so the the most successful athletes, Tim Foster, Catherine Granger, Eric Murray, Hamish Bond, um, uh, Matthew Pinson, Andy, uh, most of the time, you know, Pete most of the time myself at my best times are the ones that are feel like they're in control of the process they're in control of their destiny it's when it's taken out of your hands that you you know you can do it once right you can you follow you just follow like like a sheep the program and you get to the start line you you know you don't know what you're doing to that but if you want to keep developing and keep pushing you know you the best right you, i know me the best um, and ultimately, that's why I retired uh, or, or, or stopped was because I felt I needed something different and something more to, to, to kind of take myself to another level. I peaked at what I could achieve in the British rowing system. Now, I probably could have achieved more and it did change a bit, but I wasn't patient. But I wanted to go and do something different that I was in control of to test myself against other people in the world um to, to take myself to the next level so i think the the people that are are going to be the best or or if you want a bit of advice is it's don't just follow like a sheep you know lead like it like like the shepherd you know understand what you're doing why you're doing it and control how you're doing what you're doing that's why i, I would i my advice would be yeah i like that. control i definitely think tom james was the best example right he would cruise through so much training you know, Tom. Uh, uh, you know, he would he would be like, "What is he doing?" You know, but he was in charge of himself. He knew when he had to back up. Whereas I was trying to prove myself every day. Yeah, I was on the line all all the time. Well, that was very good at that. Knowing when he was about to go go down, he'd take a couple of days off and just look after himself. And yeah, or do you know, the coach's thing, or do something different. I mean, well, he would do like different exercises in the gym because he knew that was what he needed to do. Um, and, and I and I had my best times when I was uh, when I was really in control of my own program. I, when I was either pissed off, um, you know, and angry, Alex, or 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 uh, or I was, um, you know, I was really. I felt like I was the one driving the direction I was going. We were just saying when you're out of the room, Al, uh, in 2008, when Tom was in the Thames Cup and I was coaching the ladies' place out here, they were on some wild nonsense. So I let them run with it. That was it, and they really pissed off we were and I let them do it. And that was the way they came together. They felt that they had okay, the bus stopped with me, but it was their project. And I had to let them get on with it. And I let Angsy told me off for listening to my crew too much. And I was going to say, Angsy, Danny Merritt's won seven penny medals. I'm not going to ignore that bloke at all. And so they, they felt like they had ownership of their own, own program. Yeah, I think you've, we spoke about this before. So Ben Welbin brought it up. You can, you can have your perfect plan on paper, but you've actually got to coach what's in front of you. Oh, if you've got uh, a... Oh, my God. Take, can, I've always said play what's been in front of you. Yeah. People have turned tens years ago and they're like, oh, we do squad. It's like, no. Turn up every day. <coughs> Sean Barrow and Richard Spratt, that they don't sort of write, here's a sign-up sheet. He's going to be here this day. Because that's what they had at tens. You had a sign-up sheet and you say, you're going to be here for this session. So you spend... I never did it. I refused to do it. Okay, you're going to work it all out and then, oh, there's a chief strike and three people haven't turned up. Mm -hmm. The two hours you put it, so what, turn up. And if you're not there, someone else is going to steal your seat. Play what is put in front of you. Every, absolutely. Yeah, and that's another thing, sort of going to the point of like ownership <laughs> and stuff. I know, um, I feel like a lot of training is like, people are like, right, I'm doing all of this to be able to put down my perfect performance in my final, whether that be the Olympics or Henley or whatever it is. But I think actually, but then that sort of leads to a situation and we spoke to Al Sinclair and I think John Collins as well, sort of looking back and being like, I, you know, at the Olympic finals, the water's crap and this is horrible. Where there's not perfect. Yeah. And going halfway down, he said, I sort of really pissed off that still sort of, you know, 500 in. God, is this really my Olympic final? Like, yeah, it is. It's happening right now. Mm. So I think you can kind of own it a bit more by, yeah, understanding that the point is to be able to do your best with what's in front of you, whether you're the coach or the athlete. You're not trying to be perfect because you well, won't get perfection. Yeah, you've got to, you, you, you've, um, by the time you get on the start line, all the work has been done. I was like, my 2015 eight attempts, we asked them what was your hardest race, and not one of them said the Henley semi final. 
not one of them. It was a seat race or it was Ghent or it had all been done before. By the time we got here, that was it. They named that barge race that Zulu, Connie's Zulu launched. There's a very good video of it. Um, that the whole, uh, the future attempts hung in the balance for about a minute when they were linked down after a quarter mile against Bars Club and Connie threw the race power out the window, brought the push forward. I, don't, I blacked out, um, but that the whole future of 10 basically hung on that, that one minute. Um, but not one of them said that was their hardest rest in the matter. I linked down at the barrier, and the, many of them did in that position many times. Um, but it, it was all been done. And a lot of us did a selection. And yeah. Talking about these, this is people talking about, you know, selection. We were brutal in 2015. Absolutely brutal. We didn't have to let the tree light, um, Brooks this evening. You couldn't just, we had to be old fashioned seat racing. And now, now it's all just as I was just saying yesterday, it's just Don and Watts and you know, that worked brilliantly. It's a lot easier. Um, we had to, we had to do it differently, but it meant when the shit hit the fan, they'd been in that position many times and they, they just dealt. Well, that's the thing. You don't always win by being able to put down the fastest, fastest split than the other crew or than the opposition is you need to adapt to what's in front of you, the circumstances. Okay, cool. This is our race plan, but they've made a push. We're going to be behind. We're going to run out of water. We need to do something now. You need to be adaptable. You need to be versatile. Think on your feet. And also, like, have this skill and the confidence that you obviously you carry from your training, from, like, the work that you've been doing with your coaches in order to be able to successfully execute that. And I guess that's 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 what makes you win. Yeah, you've got to survive first contact with the enemy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it all goes. That's it. No matter what plans are, it goes out the window. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I know Brooks, in the faith. Train, <laughs> Brooks trained for every eventuality. You know, they're two lengths down, you're a length and a half up and you call a crowd and they try and get out to Wimbledon and they try and practice. We should do much the same thing at Thames. Um, you try and put yourself in every single position. I think that's brilliant. I mean, we didn't do, we, we never did that. Right. And I mean, we were, well, that's what, I guess that was, that's my biggest frustration, you know, is that, and this is a part. Not quite part, enough outside uh, the box thinking was there for the national team. Well, no, but I think it's also the challenge of like the crews changing all the time. Right. So you, you know, we're changing the boat for London Olympics, okay, and Beijing even, you know, right right up until like weeks, of, you know, a couple of weeks before. You're still sorting your start out, you know, three weeks before the Olympic Games, and you're changing it midway through the Olympic Games. Um, so we never trained for all, you know, eventuality. We trained, we trained for our race plan, our race plan, which was to, you know, get out, get it in the lead, and then you know, then dominate the race from there, um, and and that worked really well for us. But you know, eventually people caught on. I mean, I've been, I've been in some crews where we had the adaptability to respond, but most of the crews I was in, I would say, did not have the the adaptability. Certainly that that I've seen in those Brooks crews, and and I to be honest, I haven't seen uh, in the British team at the at the moment. You know, they've got one way. It's like getting the lead, um, uh, and or, or, or there are thereabouts, um, and that's what stuffed the the British pair this you know summer. Mm-hmm. Is like they weren't in the lead, and they just didn't know how to respond. Um, the the race was you know um, or, or the race was taken on by the by the horns you know within six hundred meters, and the, the Irish changed the whole race for everyone. Well, that that pairs event is yeah. fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with the uh, the Croatians coming back now, so you well, know, there's, there's more. It's easier for the small nation, you know. So yeah, to get an eight, it's just not enough people. Uh, it's a shame. You know, like the Kiwi pair. You know, they, I, I, this Eric Murray and Hamish Bond. You know, I think they're just an unbelievable combination. I and mean, we were listening to his podcast um, the other day about how you know they looked at things. You know, they uh, they could do anything at any time like any anywhere you know they knew they knew how so i think i think what, to be the best in, in you know in in the world you you need to be able like eric murray and a lot of other you know, the canadian eight that we talked you need your best your worst performance to be this close to your best performance so you win on a bad day um and the other thing is you need to know exactly what it is that you it looks like that you're doing right and there are quite a few crews like with like the four i was in with andy and pete and steve like we we knew how we were gonna nail you know we knew exactly how we're doing we had a solid plan that worked for three years nobody could touch it but then as soon as somebody started adapting to it we just didn't know how to how to respond from it um 
Uh, whereas like before I was in, in with, um, with, uh, Langers and Alex Gregory and Rick, you know, we could, we could race lots of different ways. It just depending on, you know, what day Rick woke up out in, the, in bed, <laughs> you know, but we, we, you know, we wanted to get out fast and we could get out fast, but sometimes we'd be behind and then Rick would switch it on and bosh, you know, and or Langers would start hammering it from, you know, for the finish line. And suddenly, you know, I'm just there sitting in the bow seat, holding it level. <laughs> um, and just telling everybody else what to do Ta so we could tactically respond. Uh, I think that goes back for me again a little bit to like um, kind of what you guys were saying about well exactly what Al was saying about work out what the benefit the best benefit for you from this session is like you're not here just to end yourself like what can you actually gain from it and we were talking to sort of Zoe and Morgan about coxing so one of their sort of bugbears is the Cox at every piece is trying to start in front or trying to be out the stream and this and that. And they were like, how about, how about try starting down? Try starting a length down. Choose the stream. You know, like put yourself in all those different places. Like the aim of today in this random two, two Ks against some other random crew is not to smash them. No one, no one cares. Like how do you get the most out of this session? It's not about starting half a length up and being, oh, we beat you today. Because you're trying to win in two months, three months, six months time. Yeah. So actually like putting yourself in all those different well, positions. Well, if you're training on a river as well, it's never going to be ideal. And that river racing disappears. Dead yeah. art stage, it's all dawn one, two, three. It's yeah. Real night. Yeah. But that was the beauty of being at 10 is you're out there with a couple of eights and it's never going to be dead. So you just really? have yeah. to make it up on the hoof. Yeah. That was the best training I ever did. Oh, side by side. Side by side. The river. Front. That's what everyone You does. know, tucked it like one, Bass crew and string, string sharing, and then you you know go around the corner. Right, we got to move now because the corner's coming. We need yeah. to get up, and then they come back, yeah. and then it's how you hold your nerve, and then you get it back and do it, and then they go, or you know what you how many hours do we do pieces to get a lot. play piece? And I'd be looking at Ben, and I'd be like, they blow, yeah. they blow, and down. Yeah. 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 they and shouting, yeah, so they're trying to get in their head, yeah, and that would be kicking the launch. Yeah, I mean that was the <laughs> oh, best. Such a lot. It was the best training. That I, I mean, look, you know, in terms of like experience, in terms of learning about oh, seriously hard, yeah, how to pull hard, seriously hard, how to 26. how to communicate in a boat with the rest of your crew, how to uh, be tactically aware, you know, with you know how to be race savvy, how to be a waterman, how to use the river. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I do think that you know you're talking about you're talking to the cops of the boat race, or you know you're talking about the Henley Henley. You know, side by side like a uh, matched racing like so you know one one versus one is very very different to to to, to six lane mm. olympic you know racing at the olympics like there is tactics right there is you can break a crew you can break a crew whereas when you've got six boats you can you can use all the different boats to put pu push off of the other thing is like i so i think i think that um you know when i when i listen to to when I think about my best rowing at that level in in the six lane rowing, um, uh, was um, um, execution of your strategy. Like you had such a clear, clear plan. It wasn't about mm. reacting. I mean, yes, it is about reacting. It's about understanding what's happening around you. But your plan was so clear, and you mm. could execute it at the highest level, time and time and time again. That's about how, that's how you how how you create. If you haven't got it, if you don't know exactly what your plan is going into that race, and you've done it before, then it's a different ball game. And this is what this was what the Olympic final was like in London in 2012. Is like, you know, it's a big difference sitting there the night before the final, going, "We're going to do something we've never done before." Right? We've never done this. We are going to lead the German. We're going to go as hard as we can until we're in the lead and we're going to keep going until that point and that means that we could blow our doors off and we've never done that before you know that's so different right you're going you suddenly you get a lot of time you'd be on the on the start line of the world champ final you know you can win or you know you know you're there thereabouts you're not nervous you start to lose the nerves after a couple of years but when you're about to go and do something that you, it's like being back at J15 Colt Snat School. Yeah, remind yourself. I'm still not going to die. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not, I'm not kidding. I'm, I, I had to remind myself I'm not going to die. And um, what's you know what was bizarre is like, you know, in 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 London, you know, we did it. We we went as hard as we could. But what's so funny is, you didn't feel the pain. 
you don't actually feel when you're sick of it you don't do you if you're popular so it's like people go through the pain barrier so it's when you're so bogged down and what you're doing you don't you're not aware yeah it's like you were elevated from what your body was doing and actually when we blew um i mean i uh, i know yeah like the, um when we blew up like i didn't actually feel like my body was blowing up uh, in fact i thought you know i felt so i felt so strong in that race um but i just felt that something was just disappearing and but when we crossed the finish line you know it was like ears ringing no sight you know just total you know and the pain was so immense you know our langers had to get oxygen couldn't go on the metal podium for a period of time you know i couldn't get out of the boat you know everyone was in peace i mean constantine lewis ended himself he went like, he was around about quarter slide wasn't he yeah was like we're um, like you know like he he basically because he was like you know i look I, i'll show you guys i can get the boat out i can do this and that guy is solid like strong as an ox mm. rose amazing and we're you know we're flying but like we're going for when the doors he you know he ended himself as did many people in our you know i mean i think we all did um and and but what i was going to say is there's a big difference about not having ever done that in training not even trying it not even trying it i remember john west when i was running in a pair with alex gregory john west got me and alex gregory to practice um just rowing uh these two we did 250 500 meter pieces and we just we just we did them at like 43 just tight like t like eight 500s back to back at 43 and, and he was like i want you guys to practice just going as hard as you can for as long as you can because that's the only way you're going to be nnp um and well, funny enough, you know we did amazing in those pieces but you know we, and in training we were great but we never beat Andy and Pete in when it came to it because they were the ones that could execute really execute what they wanted to on the on the day but um yeah you you you've got no chance of um it, it, um, all I'm saying is the pressure bef before trying to do something you've never done before um in that in that in that Olympic on that state yeah, yeah on that day I tell you what like on my hands were like shaking like this on the oar um but you know like just i was just shake i couldn't stop like this it was like this and i was like i'm trying to look cool you know next to the cruise next to me and i, I and i'm like i how are we gonna do this how are we we're, how are we going to survive um if we're gonna do what we're gonna do sometimes that's what it takes to win something that you weren't necessarily meant to win or that people didn't have you put down to i lost one of my plate finals against cal um that was quite yeah it was Complete. it was Cal was three feet, yeah. We basically, we'd seen all their times. It was a fast, we were a fast year. We knew they were good. And the guy stroking it was a guy, Steve Tuck, who'd been at Leander as a junior a couple of years before. Not that he wasn't bad, but, you know, it felt like there were guys in it that were coming up. And basically the whole race plan was like, we know we're fast. We know they've got a first fast first K. We know they've never held on to it. We just absolutely stick to our plan and change nothing else and just stick to our plan. And they went out hard and then we came to the k and we're like just stick to our plan just stick to our plan and then they they did what you guys did and they were just like fuck it throw throw yeah. it all out there we're going to do something we never did and they hung up and we and we lost that race that, because we were just like racing experience yeah. as well that yeah. americans have that we just don't yeah. have them we're now everyone has started changing what they're doing so um because henry's such a good thing but that match racing thing they have you know six seven match races yeah. per spring it does the thing do it? Make, it does make it a lot of yeah. Yeah. I, I also think the younger you are, like the easier it is. Ignorance is bliss. Yeah, yeah. You like you know, like I'm I remember riding with you, you know, in at Brooks and like, right, we're gonna go now, you know, and you're like you're like wait, how far away are we this is so far? You know, and uh and um and and, and you, you you make it. Um, but like, as you get older, you just become more and more, and especially if you train in a certain way, you become more and more and more ingrained mm. in the way that you've done things to break out of that is so tough. So, which is why exactly what you're saying, you know, uh, you need to have that variability in the training. You need to be training all those different ways, those different patterns, particularly mentally, mentally is the hard thing. I mean, because now it's getting so scientific and you know, this is how you, this is what you should be doing. It's polarized training, we're looking at multi lane racing. Flat pace all it, the way through. some degree, it has sucked a bit of the fun out of it in some respects. So there's still a much of an art as it is science, I think. Mm. Um, I mean, I've never really had telemetry and stuff like that. So I've had to get quite creative and more inventive. 
Um, it is going down. It is going down quite a uh, polarized route. If that makes sense. Yeah. More and more science comes in. I remember having this conversation with Mark Banks in the downstairs years ago um, when he was coaching in the team. And I, I said, "Is coaching R or science?" Oh, science, definitely. That's right. Well, what about managing Josh Davis? <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, Clive Kelly. No, that is an R. And it's all very well. You could know yeah. that all there is here. For, or, you could know or all there is to know about the sport. But at the end of the day. Or me. <laughs> but <laughs> Dustin, <laughs> maybe, yeah. um, or you. Yeah. Or Al. But, but <laughs> I think that's the point there is a lot of it. Rowing is the easy bit. It is actually all shit around it. Mm. You should have been talked about. And it is the man management. And yeah, you, I think your point about giving ownership to crews. You know, Mike, he's not his fault that uh, one in 16, they, that was their project. And I let them run with it. And I think, and, you know, you top crews. Yeah, they very much do have a say. Yeah, novices aren't going to drive because they don't know what the hell they're doing. But the higher up the scale you go, the more autonomy you need to give to the athletes because they're there because they're bloody good. Absolutely. And that thing that you guys are talking about, you know, like breaking the pattern, doing something you've never done before, even at an Olympic stage, absolutely ending yourself to the point where you can't go on a podium to collect the medal that you just won. Like, isn't that the essence of what the Olympics really is about? Yeah. Like how to put down the performance. If you, if you stand up to collect your silver medal, you haven't tried hard enough. Yeah. He's right. Yeah, somewhere. And you, yeah, that's it. That is it. And you're not going to die, but that's how... You never said that. Going. I never really said that. I mean, he did. No, I've read, I've read it in, in yeah, his yeah. book or Greg Gray's book. I've read it in one of those books. And I think, well, that's a pretty... I mean, uh, you know, the one thing that you, I remember Jürgen saying <laughs> distinctly before my Beijing final was, you know, just make sure you don't lose the silver medal. You know, so like, you know, you can, coaches, coaches can say some brilliant things, but they can also say some things that are just. Yeah, like, that was interesting. Well, quite didn't, I haven't yeah, Al and I, you know, we were all just like, we ne never thought about winning the gold. I'm not, I'm not blaming Jurgen, but like, that was just such a, an odd thing to say. Yeah, well, like, one more trade away. So, yeah. You know, like right before you vote for the Olympic final yeah. to say. Showing that, showing a Make that as, as you lose sure. the silver medal. I mean, I've never raced a race in my life thinking about bronze, silver, gold. And, you know, I've just thought about getting in front and keeping in front that's it or winning you know or you know just like that like just winning that's all i've ever thought about in my rowing career i've never ever thought about i'm racing for fourth or i'm racing for third or whatever and you know a lot of times i was racing like just to get in the, you know not be in the b final um <laughs> i even when i was in the crew in the, the 2001 uh, in the eight with like Luca Grubor, Kira West, Steve Trapmore, all Olympic gold medalists, and we're in the C final, no, B final, we come twelfth to like Egypt and oh, I can't remember the other crews there, but like, you know, just so far off the pace. Still thinking about winning. Just not going anywhere. Um But look, you've had Ben and I on the podcast uh in, in the in in both on individually uh is there anything that anybody wanted to know specifically from either of us that you know are between us we've got combined what 40 or maybe more 50 odd years of rowing we've had a we've had one comment uh after your podcast i'm just going to get it up um we've had more than one comment but there's one in particular that i wanted to like respond to um it was um remit uh, Remember CAS Christmas show in Mumbai? I was five golden rings. It's Eleanor from Sumatra. I share your birthday, Jan 25th, but I am one year older. I remember telling you that, but you couldn't have a birthday party on the 25th. <laughs> I remember my dad, Dr. Steve, and my Barbie house with the roaches. That's directed to you, Alex. Oh, it, I can cut. I can, it's crazy. I can cut this. How if specific? Yeah, yeah. Spam? No, 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 no. It's true. It's true. So her. Her dad was the math teacher, I think, at, at Caltech American School in Rumbai, Indonesia, which is where I lived uh, from the age of five to 11. Mowgli, yeah. Uh, Mowgli. Well, that's what you said last time. Yeah, I was like Mowgli. I yeah. like <laughs> where, um, where, where, uh, wear shoes or anything. So uh, I don't know what the the username is, but uh, Eleanor. 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 I can't, Eleanor Brown. I can't, well, I can't. I only remember a few people from back then, but um, I don't, I mean, I don't, yes, I don't remember not being able to have a birthday on my birthday, but. Um, Is that due to training? Or just being somewhere else? Uh, well, no, I think she still, because she had the same birthday, so she wouldn't permit me to have a birthday on her the same day as hers. Because oh. there's only like 20 kids in the community or, you know, 30 kids in the community, they'd all have to go to one birthday party. And Anyway, I don't know. A bit odd, bit odd. But with regards to my birthday, 
my birthday pretty much every year for 16 years was the day that we did the 5k ergo test oh. 25th of January. so it was either like the day you know two days before or we were at altitude um, i can never remember celebrating my birthday um ever <laughs> yeah day. i did i had seven of seven on 28th of jan which was banyola's winter camp at leander so I had seven seven yeah. of my birthdays on winter camp but then it was kind of weird because then i would You'd be with all your mates. Yeah, I'd wake up and kind of feel a bit like, oh, I'm not seeing my family or anything today. But then kind of almost immediately be like, but where else do you want to be? Yeah, yeah, Like, yeah, you're, yeah. like you're living the dream Doing here. chosen yeah. for why. Yeah. yeah. No, I think mine was bit. always 5K ergo test. We were back in the country and, um, yeah, it was 5Ks. In fact, I think they're doing them downstairs right now. Man, yeah, it, they are. Yeah. I remember 20, you remember this, 23 or 2000. Um, and my birthday. They, no, it was actually around. I think it was on about all my Valentine's Day. Actually, you ruined me. We went. We went. Birthday. We went for a run. We oh, ran about. Oh, it was at night. It was night. Remember? It was at night. No, no, it was. It was oh night. no, we ran from north from East Oxford to. We ran. We ran for three and a half miles. Oh, yeah, as an extra trip. And something like probably eighteen miles or something ridiculous. No, it was just yeah. for fun. And I remember I, at the time we ran all the way like patio. We've gone quite a long way. We got to go and we did it. And I, I've never been so shit. So I think I probably was that year in 2000. Oh yeah, it was amazing. That was that was so. We, we were so, in such good shape. Yeah. Well, we did. We did do. Quality. We were in the eight together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You said oh, six, me, you yeah. seven. Yeah, six. Yeah, seven. I remember. I remember. So I was in the eight with them. That was my first year at Brooks, and um, you know, I was like rowing with Ben and uh, you know Ed Russell, these amazing juniors. Then we had a couple of kind of guys who were a bit a bit rough around the edges, but quite strong. And then Desi, Ian Desmond, who's 38, he was 38 yeah. years old. Coached Henry Ryan Club, 2005. Yeah, is, uh, that, yeah. is that the uh, cabinet maker? So there's a story where he like wanted to win Henley. Yeah, so yeah. So signed yeah. on to a woodwork course at Brooks. But like, and then, but didn't tell his wife? Didn't yeah. tell his wife and would drive up to the university. He actually, and he'd park his, because he has Ian Desmond cabinet maker. <laughs> so he'd park it in the sort of the tradesman area at Brooks. Yeah. Even though he was a student, yeah. he would actually did do something. I, I was in a lecture. I was in a lecture with him, and I remember him going okay, the break of the lecture, him going out, and he was like talking to a stockbroker to kind of play the market to keep the income coming in. Yeah, his wife uh, never knew. Yeah. And we lost I was group. nineteen, we lost nineteen, final. and he was thirty-eight. Um, and you turned around to me on day one, and you and watched it to yourself, this, mate. The Nihon University, Japan. No, it was Rutgers. That was Rutgers, Rutgers uh, University. So I remember it. <laughs> I listed off all the under 23 crews they've beaten, which is all of them, Barber Germans. Yeah. The light international highway crew, they didn't, yeah, okay. And it's, we're going to win, which is fine. Because you were very nervous that year. Oh, I was so nervous because I'd never, I'd never gone past Wednesday on a, in, a, in Henley. And then, you know, we're at Rutgers, I've never even heard of Rutgers University. And I turned to Ben and I was like, are we going to win this? And went, yeah, we're going to, we're going to win it. I remember, I remember Ed Russell telling me, he was like, uh, I think it was before the head of the river, and I was like, "Oh, you know, like, do you think we're going to do okay?" And he goes, "He goes, um, okay, yeah." Uh, he, uh, he, go, he goes, "Alex, most people have never rode the full distance of this race in one outing. We're going to be okay. Yeah, Thirty k. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh. We're going to be okay." Um, but yeah, that was that was funny. But then we lost. So we that was back in that that was a fun. That was an awesome eight. It's so really fun. Uh, we, you know, Ian Desmond, Will DeLaslo, Aiden Riley, uh, Phil Wright, Ben Nigel Lewis, Maynard. Nigel Maynard, Phil Wright, uh, Ben Lewis, was Alex Partridge, and Ed Russell, and and call it call it yeah. And uh, we had we had such a laugh. That was like the best introduction to rowing for me. Um, we just pulled so hard and we rated pretty high. No, we, we couldn't rate high. Oh, we couldn't rate high. That was it. Oh, we just went one street at 35. Yeah. That was it. One street. But anyway, we, we faced in the semi final in the morning on the Sunday, we faced Brown University, who were the, um, uh, who were the JV champions. Yeah. Junior varsity champions, national champions of the US. Um, and, down on the and we rode them down, heavy stream, rode them down on the outside. We won by like half length, three quarters of length. Something like that. Then we have to go back to Desi's house for five hours and then get. We go back to Desi's house for five hours. Had the final five hours later. Five hours later against Yale lightweights, who are also the varsity lightweight champions. And um, again, we're on the outside. They raced Exeter that morning. Yep. They won easily, uh, rate 28. And we had this 
gut buster of a race with them. We were down the whole way. And then I think we got the lead a little yeah, bit. We never got, never got the lead. Never, never got the lead. Got from. Um, and we lost the final by like basically one foot. No, no. No, it was quite It wasn't like we almost got a level and then they snuck around the channel. Okay, it was a couple of feet. It was about half a length, but it wasn't much. Yeah, my story's better. A couple of feet. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to do the photo of the crew, flat of jet photographic. Dead level. Sure. No, no, no. All of us. Half of us. Yeah. Absolutely flat. I've all been shot. Yeah, so it was, it was devastating. Um, and there's loads of things we could have done better between the recovery and all that. You know, we didn't do any recovery. Um, but in the following year, I was in the visitors for those and um, with Tom Burton, um, Gareth Corey, and uh, James Brown. And we, our first race of the sea, of, the, of Headley is against Yale Lightweights, and it's four of the guys from the crew from the year before. And I am Jack up to the eyeballs so pumped so nervous i am like just you know super angry alex and we tear off and we get you know like four lengths clear i think we win easily we cross the finish line and i am throwing up i'm vomiting everywhere i am absolutely done and i turn around and the other three are going what the hell's wrong with you and i was like what you you guys didn't back off and they were like I start pulling it like the barrier. So I basically <laughs> just been ranking it all the way to Pay back. Yeah. But that, that I remember uh, um, you talk about, you know, when you don't even realize you're blowing the world of pain you're in. That race in 2000. Oh, yeah, same. So Clyde Kennedy Byrne, who was here many years ago, said to me, we were in the driving back from Ben He said, why did you, what did you like about rank? And um, I said, right, I'll give you a moment in time. 2000 final of the uh, Temple Cup, and we're at the bottom of the. We're coming to the Pleasant Enclosure. We're half a length down. We're coming back on Yale, and I remember thinking, right, last minute and a half, this is it. End yourself, and we're going to win this by foot. I don't remember anything else. That's it. That's the last I remember of that entire race. Turns out we lost, but oh, I would. I still. I remember that point, and I was like, this is fucking. Awesome. This is exactly why I do. And a lot of your guests said, it's exactly where I want to be. It's not about the medals. At the end of the day. It's actually the memories and the mates you make. And I was still, that eight was a great laugh. And we had a hell of a season. No, we didn't quite win. To, there's a lot of things we could have changed and should have changed in hindsight. But I probably wouldn't change anything. And that, that I don't, I'm very proud of. I don't remember the last being close because I got, I put myself in such a hole. I don't remember it hurting. That's why I thought we were like a foot. Yeah. I was because you were so absorbed in what we were yeah. doing and trying to win that race. That it, it didn't hurt, and you see the photos across the line, and it, it literally like someone's just taking a machine gun. Down the well, but, that's, but that's it. How hard are you pulling when it's ninety seconds until your season is basically finished? But you're talking to you about struggle. Europeans the other day, yeah, my, and the exact same thing. I remember my European final in the eight in twenty twelve, sort of like the B team, weren't we? Um, yeah, that thought of being like, I guess like red, Bo like red boys, okay, now and then like. Red boys, don't right? that's, like, that's, that's, that's like that's like that's like thirty seven returns. That was the end. So we had the yeah. three. Ninety seconds three. is way longer than red boys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the whole thing was three. The three tier no, last no, five hundred. You don't I remember that last races. bit just missing, just missing. I just yeah, yeah. many races in your life where you are every stroke that point of race is as hard as you can make it, mm. and I mean, it's just yeah. the, you're looking across and then not sure is that it doesn't hurt at all. Because you are so absorbed. I was just as a kid to hear about into the pain barrier. To me, that's what it is. I reckon. I reckon I was the world's consistently the world's fastest, best rower across all boat classes over fifteen hundred. <laughs> all right, you come for the comeback and then. The problem is, it's a two thousand meter race. You going for LA? Yeah, I was like, I well, we never had telemetry. <laughs> I I telemetry. was I was checked out yeah. pretty much every race. We had 500 to go. Like, Four and a half. The only oh, one, I, I never had a sprint. I never really had yeah, a sprint. The only one I wasn't, the only one I wasn't was one, it was, it was our Henley final with, when I had Tommy Burton in the stroke seat. And um, and he was basically rowing uh, on stroke side, but his body is <laughs> rowing on bad stuff. <laughs> and, and I was, and I, and I could see this starting to happen. And I was just going, Tommy. And like, I know that I wasn't blowing in that race, but I mean, pretty much every single one I was done, I was being carried. And I think Jürgen knew that as well. Yeah. So I yeah. mean, like, you know, this panel has been great. Like right in having Ben, you know, Ben was like a massive uh, influence in my rowing career. It was great to row with him. And Al also was, you know, and Al was saying like, he didn't like rowing at all. Like for someone who hates something so much, 
he spent his entire life <laughs> around rowing. And, you know, he, he, like, he was a nightmare to manage. He was a nightmare to manage. Yeah. He, got he, he got bored. God, he made rowing fun. He got bored super easily, but like he did row really, really well. And his, 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 his saying, I, I don't mind saying I do strike a mighty final. <laughs> <laughs> and like he would do it. And like he would just, every stroke, he would like, look at his cap. And he had, the, he had like this perfect flat shoulders. And Al's proportions are funny. He's got super long arms, super long, long, built, right, super long legs, legs and like tiny. Torso. <laughs> so he had just like these flat arms. And there I'd be like trying to get like cash. And like, eh, like this. Uh, but you know he was he was awesome awesome to row with um and uh and, and i you know i wouldn't have changed it for the world um but yeah no it was awesome yeah i appreciate it thanks for oh, there's, thanks a, there's for a lot of things we probably could have touched on we'll do more it's just probably a good thing we didn't yeah i know but uh, no, there's always another episode oh yeah we'll get you definitely get you back on train hard and party hard he I'm sure advice, actually. if you've been listening to podcasts, I bring it up a lot now, like turn up, train hard, have fun. And that's really, that's, it, yeah. that's, that's the simplest way to put it. I think, I mean, Al's point, both of his point about taking ownership of a real project. Obviously, you can't just tell you. Yeah. yeah that, that is a huge being part of it. And, I, and Al's point, really good hearing that. I should have said to him, actually, because Club Rowing, I've always been likened to a bit to the TA, the Terrace Will Army, because mm. Montgomery always said, I respect our soldiers, but I really respect the part-time soldiers. Mm. Because they, they go to work and then we can start training and, and club running is very, 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 very much like that. Yeah. And Al, he, he did a very good job at Thames. Um, and he, you know, he won a red box with a full time job as did I. And it's, it's so hard. Um, so to hear that from Al, he does disparage rowing regularly and says he hates it. Yeah, he, he still loves it. He actually loves it and he has a lot of respect for him. A socialized general manager. Look, we all love hate it. It's, uh, yeah. I think it's the same it's for everyone. It's a toxic relationship. <laughs> I loved it. I absolutely love it. I still love it. Cool. So now we're back to uh, just just the three of us, our usual format. Uh, there was. <laughs> you can make it if you're anyway. <laughs> there was, singing. Is there was there was one there was one uh, story that we didn't get out from the last time we spoke to you. I mean, the podcast was fantastic. We got such brilliant reviews. Like people still message us saying that they've really enjoyed hearing a story, the honesty, and just authenticity was a really big one, and that's just brilliant. But we didn't ask you about the time that you beat the German eight in the Hansa Cup. Oh yeah. Yeah, that was pretty awesome. Um yeah, so I yeah, that was oh, I'm trying to remember what year that was. Was that twenty ten? Something like twenty ten. Yeah, it must have been twenty ten. Um so yeah, so I was in the four with um Matt Langridge, um uh, Alex Gregory, Rick Eggington and myself. And um it was oh yeah. It was no, no. It must have been 2011. Mm -hmm. Must have been 2011 because uh, it was a long season, and the Hansa Cup was before the World Championships okay. uh, in Carapira. In and the, and the World Championships were like in October, uh, because you know it's their it their summer is our winter. Yeah, yeah. Although it wasn't really much of a summer. <laughs> uh, I think it moves into the maelstrom windstorm. On uh, Lake Carapura, but we'll leave that for another uh, another conversation, um, and why um, the fairness commission on uh, for FISA should be a hell of a lot better than it is. I mean, the, 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 this year's World Championships are great; it's a great result. We have people falling in at the World Championship should never happen. No, uh, and I think that's embarrassing to the sport. Um, but anyway, um, I yeah, so I was in the forum. We've had a we had a unbeaten season. In 2011, um, what happened? We were, yep, we won. We didn't. I think we didn't do Henley. I can't remember exactly, but we won three World Cups, uh, or maybe I can't remember two. And then uh, we we had this long training period, and Jurgen was like looking. You know, basically, we'd done the Hands Cup. But we never won it. Uh, you know, he went with a Super Eight in the first year that it was done in 2001, mm -hmm. uh, to, two with Pinson and the uh, Cracknell and like the four, um, Rick Dunn, Ned Coot, all those guys, Toby Garber, Steve Williams, they didn't win it. Um, and, uh, then I'd done it. I'd come, you know, come pan last or third or something, maybe twice before or second, um once and then anyway so we put this aid together and we sent um it was andy and pete myself and our four so rick matt alex and me and i think we had tom wilkinson uh in it yeah. yeah tom wilkinson and marcus 
And was it red? Yeah, Bateman. Big red, Marcus yeah, yeah. Bateman. Yeah, Wilco and, and Bateman in the dirty seat. And then the British eight, which was like Greg Searle, uh, Cameron Nickel, Tom Broadway. Uh, Ransley, Dan Ransley, Ritchie. Dan Ritchie, uh, James Clark, maybe? No, yeah. maybe he wasn't in it at that stage anymore. Uh, James Fode, Mosby, yeah. yeah, all that. Big boys. Big, yeah, big eight. And uh, they got silver that summer in Carapira. Um, uh, it was, and it was also just more of a break, you know, for us in the eight. We kind of jumped in, did a few sessions out of Cambridge. We were kind of there, thereabouts with the R8, our, our other eight over a thousand meters in the windiest conditions ever known to man, you know, boat steering all over the place. And, um, uh, who was Cox here? Was it was Henry Fieldman. Henry yeah. Fieldman was Cox here. So he just, just kind of jumped into the eight with us. Uh, and basically it was like Hodgie telling him what to say and what to do. Um, and we went out to Germany and the, and the Germans were undefeated. It was the crew that we ended up racing in, in London. Yeah. And they never lost a race. In fact, this is, this is, this is, this is the big thing. So yeah, it, they actually were not an undefeated eight over the four years because we pumped them. You stuck in, into them. Uh, yeah. In the Eon Hands Cup. And like, we went, you know, like we were all kind of joking around and playing pretty, pretty, pretty relaxed, um, no, I think Cam was in. Uh, Cam was in R eight. Cam Nickel, possibly. I I can't remember. It doesn't matter. Yeah, maybe Cam because Cam wasn't in the British eight at that time. Okay, and then he got into the eight. Um and um yeah, we uh, basically you go off the start. You know, it's a twelve point seven kilometer race, and you go off the start, and it's six eights or five, yeah five or six eights lined up. I think the Dutch were there. Uh, maybe the Americans were there. I, mean, I can't remember exactly. Yeah. Probably the Polish. The Polish were there, um, and um, the Germans very rarely lose it. It's done on it. It's in Germany. It's I on a big. The it's last on a, time. Yeah. It's a big um, German national public yeah. bank holiday. When the Germans were good, they never lost it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what they do now. Um, I, I'd say they're not that great at the moment. But yeah, you go off to start, and you go off, and you do a twelve k race, and you start like you're gonna do a two k race. And you know, I remember we're going through to the two k mark, and we're we are sort of there or thereabouts with the Germans and our, and our British eight, and the Germans have got the inside lane, and then it's our British eight, and then us. So we're the furthest over. Um, away, and you do like four and a half K and then it's a sharp right. So you want to be on that inside to yeah. the end. And, um, and basically we just went at 2K. We just went, go now, go now. And we just did like one, two minutes, two of the hardest minutes we could do. So I think we settled down from 38 to 36 and we went back up to 38, 38 and a half. And, uh, and we just pulled out um, a lane. We started to, to push them across uh i can't remember exactly how, how how it works but basically we got that length and then we just broke past them enough to get creep across yeah so no yeah so the brit the other british shape was on our right hand side and it was yeah to do enough to creep across and then move in front um you know across their bow line yeah. we, you know, we had to get clear and then wash them down and get that corner and then we tucked in the inside and then they had to go around the out outside and then we basically just broke them at like, but they stayed like two and a half lengths behind us um, for about another 4K. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it just started like, it's just like, disappearing. Yeah, disappearing. I think we beat them by like a minute and a half, maybe more um, over the 12K. They time. couldn't react. They didn't know what was happening. No, they, they, they no, didn't no, expect. No. And we were like, you know, it, like once you get in the thing, we were, I think we were at like rate 32, 33. And you were literally like, you know, UT2 pressure, maybe a bit more, and probably more. Yeah. But just like, <laughs> you know, help the slide quicker <laughs> than you're going down it. And I remember the whole of my left arm just seized, like completely seized up and went numb. So like to the point where it was just like, I was just like, and I couldn't move. <laughs> could when we crossed the finish line, one year absolutely wrecked. Um, but then I, I, I couldn't move my arm. Um, for like the next hour and a half. Why? Wow. Yeah, I couldn't lift the boat up. Um, um, and the only thing that kind of relaxed off a little bit, a little bit of physio, but it was about seven steins of Bitburger or whatever. 
whatever. <laughs> we had a, the year we did it. Um, but that is a brutal race. Yeah, it's oh, a so brutal cool. race, and you've got yeah. to have, especially if you've done it before, you got to have like massive cojones, like huge oh, yeah. balls, to kind of just just go like at two k, two and a half k down. I go now, and you just put in like minute, two minutes the, of the hardest you can to break them. Uh, and and if if I'm totally fair, that's like where Pete and Andy were just excellent. They were like no, and they just boom went, and it was like you know the you could just they just had this flick rhythm, and um, you and basically got to accept that you will blow. Yeah, like you can't. No one's getting to the end of this without blowing. Yeah, so you just need to work until you've got yourself in front. I mean, I remember just seeing Wilco's head just going like <laughs> like. <laughs> Yeah, it must have been Wilco. Yeah, so Cam was in the other way. Um and um and and then and, you know and and it, like the to fair play, to, I mean the Germans just didn't know what happened. Like they were just like devastated. Uh, didn't talk to us afterwards. Really? I mean, look, you know, they shook our hands and stuff like that, but they were like, and uh, I thought we were invincible from you know at that point because I had that before. And funnily enough, do you know what? Two thousand and seven, we doubled up. In the uh, it, we did the we did the eight in um, in Amsterdam and we uh, we won we beat our British eight and we beat the Germans and we beat the Chinese who'd all been medalists you know the year before and we won that and that was a super eight and then funnily enough that that world champs in the four we came fourth and then in Carapiro you jump in the super eight uh, smash it and um, absolutely flying yeah you know for the whole of like the rest of the training camp and all of that kind of stuff and uh and then we go out to carapero and the final we have we're in lane four we're the favorites we want everything by miles um and um and then the uh the wind was so strong that it was like medals went lane one gold lane two silver lane oh. three bronze lane four four lane five fifth and lane six six i mean that was like that obvious for like of the six finals that day five and a six were that order and it just totally ruined the world champs, and then it ruined, and that ruined us as a four because Jurgen was looking for any excuse to 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 not to basically for us to not have the four. And in fact, you know, Annie and Pete didn't win the pair. Um, so that was it. That was that four gone. No, no, that was twenty ten. Yeah, twenty ten. Twenty ten. Yeah, yeah. twenty ten was Carapero because then, yeah, and I and I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure what happened, but why I didn't didn't get in the four in 2011 um i can't remember what what went wrong something didn't go quite right in in 2011 and um i basically ended up losing my seat race to 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 tom james um you know that was one race i lost that year <laughs> that's that's insane yeah absolutely and because i lost i what i beat everyone the following year in 2012 yeah you, in all the series well this is the thing you were top of the pack yeah. Top of the pack of but the most successful really British squad of all us. time. It was really tight between you know Matt Langridge and and Tom James and myself and, and Pete. Pete was wasn't really tested, you know. It was especially in 2012, 2012 But I'm not. Pete was for not you know just an absolute phenomenal performer on the big occasions. Mm. You know he could just and Jurgen knew that right. And I was the same all the way through. And you know I could be a liability because of injury and also because you know the way that I raced. It was like get out get out of the lead and that was a bit different to to tom james and um um but you know um there's many measures by which you can measure like um but which you can like compare two athletes and what they bring to the boat and to the boat yeah. speed and how they affect the crew what i'm really astounded by is that like even at wallingford and met and marlow they will adjust lanes if it's too windy god yeah, forbid there's a little bit know, of crosswind let alone world championship i don't understand it i think they're under pressure for the media windows probably there's a lot of things that are going on that you don't understand. Uh, I personally was super disappointed with Carapiro, right? I don't think that was a fair result. Of all the races that I did, of all the rest of the time, I wouldn't say that there was ever a situation where that was the case. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, you know, London, London Olympic Olympics, you know, it was breezy and you definitely wanted to be on the, you know, lane, uh, on the on the inside lane. Yeah. Uh, on the bar bank. To the warm up lake. Yeah, you yeah. want to be on that side, um, and they then see the lanes. At, you know, the following day and the day, the, the days after. Um, so, um, and and that was always the case. But you know, you 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 Outdoor Sport, you got to take it right. You got to you got to accept it. And 
I accept all my results. You know, I think I was lucky to train with some amazing people, you know, to be able to compete against, uh, compete against Langers uh, as one of my you know, big guys that I had to compete against to be in the four or whatever position I was in and Tom James and Pete uh, and all those other guys um, you know over the years um, I'm lucky you know, I'm lucky because that made me the athlete that I was and I was lucky to row with the people I what I rode with and I was super lucky to be coached by the people I was coached by you know John West Mark Banks and Jurgen you know huge influence on my life um, and I got to be part of some pretty cool experiences right some amazing experiences I think other people would describe you in a very similar way and say they're lucky they got to like row with you. Matt Aldridge, he named just one of his biggest rowing heroes. He said really? he said that when he turned up in 2016 and you've just shown the Brooks athletes how to how to train, you know, he said that was an insane inspiration. Like he definitely recognizes really? that he's made a big step up because of like just having you in the room and around and to push off of it to see how you train, the professionalism that you bring in, etc. Like that's. You know, he talks about it, it's like oh, these old men are coming here and like getting after it. Like, yeah, like this is what we want to do. And that was like, I mean, I remember that. You know, that was like fifty percent of how I trained in the. You know, when I was in the team. Still pulling nine k's though. Yeah, nine k. <laughs> got the best. I got the best five k at Brooks that year, in twenty sixteen. What was it? It was like sixteen oh one or something. Okay. But, uh, yeah, but they were like way off base. Sixteen oh five, maybe. Yeah. Did a sixteen not not point not not once. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I, I did it in my garden in my lunch break. Um, you know, on on grass. Wow, put the area on grass. A bit flex in there, then maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Drag, drag, maybe one twenty five. <laughs> but like, I remember, like, I just, I just didn't even look at the score for four k. I just looked up at the clouds in the back of the house. And then looked down and went, all right, okay, got to go. I love that. Um, so, yeah. No, no, I mean, look, I'm I'm just so lucky to have rode with the people I rode with. Coming back in 2016, be able to row those Brooks guys that are now, you know, the, the kind of pillar standards uh, of the of the British team. Mm. Uh, it, was amazing. it was amazing. So I know what it's like to row with Matt Aldridge and Rory Gibbs and Morgan Balding and you know, like that's pretty cool, right? So I'm still, I still feel so, so uh, connected. Yeah, so involved mentally in their results. I want them to win so badly. Like I want it nothing more mm. um, for them to win. Um, you know, I'm just, and I'm, I'll watch every single race they do. Um, and I just, I just, you know, hope and pray for those guys this, you know, this coming coming year that they just keep that consistency and that you know they 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 pull it off when it counts uh because you know that will stay with them forever you can win as many world championships as you like you know it's the but it's the olympic champions that everyone remembers um uh, so yeah good luck to them and i uh, wish them all the best and it'd be nice some nice retribution isn't it from oh, yeah. three years ago if we could pull off what we've done just at worlds yeah isn't it a measure of a champion to Come always back, look yeah. out for others and lift them up to to the standard that they yeah. they once held themselves up to. I think that's very beautiful what you said, and like I'd like to just second that. I really wish the British team all the best. Team. The whole British team. I wish we've got such an amazing chance, you know. And I don't. And this is the you know potentially the last time that we'll see rowing over two thousand meters, right? Mm. So you know, I wish them the best to, to be. Uh, to I wish them to cross the finish line feeling that they reached their absolute potential and there's nothing else they could do. And if they can do that, then 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 I think they can walk away and hold their heads up high. I just I hope that that's what they achieve. And absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much for uh helping us organize this Alex. It's always fun to chat to you. Uh it's Brilliant. fun to chat to Ben, fun to chat to Al as well. We've dropped some absolute nuggets of advice is mm. is is brilliant i think a lot of rowers and coaches and people just from around the world are going to benefit from this advice so no anytime it's, it's always fun to have you around no it's good to be here thanks for us keep up the great work keep up the great servicing of the uh, sure. rowing machines that you guys are doing i see you do great work all over the country yeah we're getting around. you know who knows globally maybe franchise out to Rossi. the u.s and uh <laughs> and also you now got that great uh uh, row gear kit with the driver the regatta robe yeah yeah yeah, yeah. regatta robe yeah it's nice. fantastic i've got one of those for the christmas present list oh, this will be out after christmas it's all right no one no one's gonna <laughs> no, find right, out okay. <laughs> right.
Uh, yeah, no, awesome. Thanks, man. Thanks, everything. And uh, yeah, I mean, let's do it again sometime. We'll, we'll, we'll get some other people together and just have another laugh. I think it'd yeah. be awesome. And remember. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> or <laughs> when training gets tough, the, the last, last stroke, stroke counts. counts. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That concludes everything for today's episode. So on that note, easy there. Cue the music. <laughs>